Hey, it's Rich Ward, the Duke of Metal from Fozzie and Stuck Mojo. And you're watching Good Company because you have good taste. Good Company! Hey guys, my name's Scott Bowling, and you're watching Good Company. Today we have the man, Rich Ward. Rich Ward is the founding member of Stuck Mojo. Um, he's also done Six Speed, he's done a solo record, and he's done Fozzie, which is blowing up right now with Judas and Painless. The same guy that filmed those two videos actually filmed the show, which is really cool. Yes. So thank Family. you for being here. Thank you, Scott. And I sat in your chair. Another thing I'm famous for at this point. Yes. It was crazy. You were like, do you have a preference in chairs? I was like, nope. And you were like, well, this one's mine. I was like, cool. And then I just sat in it. It's very, <laughs> very <laughs> awkward. I mean, like, yeah, it was great. Yeah, I left something for you there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so you have like a literally like encyclopedia. We got everything right here. This is nice. this is you right here. Uh, the first record. I guess we're gonna jump right into it since there's a lot of stuff to go over. You have freaking props. It's like yes, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. But Great Steph, artwork, Steph, by the Steph. way, Dave Johnson. I actually just started following him on Instagram recently. Just kind of, you know how you. Can reunite with him? And you, you don't like, why have I not stayed friends with this guy? He did uh, both this and uh, the Pig Walk record. Oh, and uh, and then we decided for some reason to veer away from the, the kind of comic book stuff, which I thought was a great marriage for Stuck Mojo because we were, uh, you know, so different at the time and comic books were kind of not in vogue. The, mm -hmm. the graphic novels weren't really the, the thing in 1994. <laughs> so like we decided, why don't we, you know, if we're gonna have two black guys and two white guys playing heavy metal with a rapper, with a funk bass player, uh, with dreadlocks that was completely weird for that period of time, why not just go completely, keep pushing and go with, you know, and find ourselves like our own version of Eddie yeah. from Iron Maiden. So uh, he was called the Cyber Tribal. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And you guys started back in 89, right? Yes. Around there sometime? Yes. Our first uh, moment that we said we're a band was uh, Halloween night of 1989. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. So you guys had a lot of practice before even recording this album, and you got awesome stuff here, like Not Promised Tomorrow. What was it like doing that video? Was that your first video for Stuck Mojo? It was. What was uh, that like filming that? It was killer. Uh, Drew Stone and his brother Evan filmed that video. Drew Stone has gone on to be a, a pretty big uh, director. He does documentary films. The most recent one is uh, called Who the Fuck is That Guy? It's the Michael Alago story. Oh yeah. Um, but Drew's amazing. He's uh, He's just one of those guys. He was a New York hardcore legend. He was really in uh, the camp of all of these bands, sick of it all, mad ball. Like those are his boys. Um, and we met him, you know, it was very strange because when we met him, this is, uh, at least from, from my perspective, I'm a kind of a Southern kid. I didn't do a ton of traveling. My, my father's family were all English, so we would go to England, but it, we just stayed at their little cottage in, you know, it, was like, it wasn't like I was well-cultured. They didn't know much. So here come these dudes coming down from New York and they all had, you know, white dudes with dreads and cover with tattoos from this New York hardcore thing. And I didn't quite understand that because I grew up on ACDC and Ted Nugent and ZZ Top. And I love bands like Heart and Journey and Foreigner and Kansas and Sticks. And like then I discovered some heavy bands, right? But still, I didn't, I didn't know anything about uh, the kind of New York hardcore uh, culture. And then those guys came down here and I just remember them, I made me thinking that they were super tough and cool and they were artists in a very unique way. And they were great. Um, he also, Drew Stone was a big um, historian about rock stuff. So he was, that's why we went to Macon and filmed some of the stuff in front of Barry Oakley and Dwayne Allman's graves because he was like obsessed with, Amazing. you know, rock and lore and stuff. So long story short was, it was great. I mean, we filmed the video uh, at the masquerade. That was a sold out show. Oh, that's cool. uh, yeah. I mean, this is the crazy thing about Stuck Mojo is that a lot of people don't, uh, the times have just changed. And, you know, now you get a, a record deal because of, uh, a label says, wow, this band's got some cool songs and they've got a lot of followers on Instagram <laughs> and uh, we can put them with this producer to help them write some songs. Yeah. Back then we were selling, you know, 1500 tickets at the masquerade before we had a record deal. I mean, we were a legit and we were touring. Like we were in a 1977 Dodge van touring all over the country yeah. and, uh, we were already kind of fully realized of who we were, like because we had spent so much time on the road 
and we were we we were developing our chemistry and not our chemistry in a rehearsal space but our chemistry uh, on stage every night and playing with a lot of really cool bands because that was a, a pretty interesting period of time um, in the early 90s because you know everyone was trying to break down all of these kind of barriers in between styles and so you know you had bands like Fishbone and Bad Brains and the Chili Peppers and Faith No More who were kind of coming up out of that era and there were lots of other, those are the successful ones and so everyone was like striving to just not be what the late 80s was which was kind of you know you know I guess it, you consider it hair metal or whatever so we were lucky in that we got to do our first video in front of a huge audience because it was our audience. It wasn't even, we just was a show. We didn't go, you know, not promise tomorrow video shoot. We just filmed a show and Drew Stone came up on stage and said, hey, we're gonna be cameras rolling and wanna see you guys going crazy. It's like, you know, this is back when you would look out in the Stuck Mojo audience and people were wearing foam helmets that goalies wore and mouthpieces. And like, there was never a time where I didn't go in the masquerade bathroom after the show and it looked literally like a triage center. There was so much blood and, and, and not that I was ever proud of that, but it was just, that was, that was the culture of the time was it was the, it was the birth of moshing. You know, and people were moshing at Pearl Jam concerts. So our concerts were like, literally it would just be like, all right, everybody fight on three. <laughs> and you just start and it was just, it was like the, like the, ball room, the bar room scene in a Western, you know, just like, <laughs> but it was always friendly, you know? And the th other thing was, I don't know if, if you ever remember at the old masquerade, they had boards that ran the entire length of the top of the ceiling of the masquerade by where the, the uh, I-beams were. They put those there because of us, because our fans learned they could hoist and throw each other up and they would grab a hold of the girders and then they would just uh, climb over the audience and can get on stage. Yeah, that would be great in your video. Like if you, if the, <laughs> go, go just Google search uh, or, or look on YouTube, anything from Stuck Mojo's 96, 97, 98, Masquerade, and you will see legs just kind of hanging from that area. It was crazy, it was really cool. I mean, that, and so luckily for us, we had that built-in audience um, and, the, and our fans were super excited for us too because we got a record deal, we were filming a video, and so it was, uh, it was cool. And we, you know, we built a relationship with our audience. I, you know, and that was the cool thing about that band at that time was we had four kind of characters. We were, we were before we started, we were talking about Korn. You know, we were a lot like Korn in Van Halen or Chili Peppers, and we had four dudes that were different, you know, that kind of had, different personalities and stage personas and it, it really helped make us feel like a team, not just like some of the thrash bands where everyone had black jeans and, you know, white high tops or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like sometimes you have bands that have like uniforms. Like if you look at a band like uh, Warrant, who I think was a great band for that era, but you know, with the exception of Janie Lane, if you weren't really a fan, it's like, those are the dudes. Like yeah. they weren't defined characters, you know. And I think that was kind of one of the cool things about uh, Stuck Mojo is that we had characters. You know what I mean? We were able to play up on that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Your second record, uh, Pig Walk, right here. This is a lot uh, heavier, and you're going a different kind of direction with that. Heavier. Who did you work with on this? Was it Devin? Devin Townsend? Yeah, it was Daniel Bergstrand was the producer we brought in. Oh. Daniel Bergstrand. At that time, uh, I was in love with Meshuga. There was a record that Daniel did called Destroy, Erase, Improve. Um, and uh, that record, I think, came out in like 95 or 94, something like that. And I was obsessed with that album and Daniel produced it. Uh, and, and Devin Townsend was brought in to help us with, because I was also into noise. I was getting into um, how to use samplers, um, how to use, uh, I was, you know, I was listening to Rob Zombie and and lots of industrial stuff as well. I mean, this was that again. This was this moment of like exploration, right? Yeah. Like, there were no rules. We were signed to Century Media, so it wasn't Century Media Records was a, a, a fairly small independent label uh, in America. In Europe, they were bigger, but there wasn't big budgets for us. There were pretty small budgets uh, by th those standards, and certainly by today's standards. So the record company just believed in us. They just said, eh, 
yeah, we dig what you guys do. Do your thing. I mean, the A&R guy um, who had signed us, who was our, was our A&R rep all the way through Rising, uh, was a guy named Borivar Kurgan who now runs Blabbermouth. That was his baby. He invented it and he, he now runs it. Um, and he would come to the studio, but not so much to kind of like sit in the back and make critiques. You know, he was there kind of as, as the representative of the label to show up and just say, hey, how things going? Do you need anything? He was really a, a cheerleader for us. And Devin Townsend was signed to Century Media as well. So that's why Devin, uh, and Devin had just, I don't even think the second Strapping Young Lad record was out yet. It was just Heavy as a Heavy Thing was the first stra strapping record. And so Devin was really kind of just building his brand um, and came in to help us because, you know, I had all these great ideas. But in the big scheme of things, when Pig Walk uh, was kind of being written and crafted, we had a new uh, drummer and a new bass player. We had Corey Lowry on bass. And we had Frank Fonsere who came in uh, playing drums because uh, Brent and Dwayne uh, from the, the Snapping Next record had left the band. They weren't fired. It was just Dwayne had two young kids and we were playing 250 shows a year. And a lot of times when you're uh, a, a, a new dad, you have no idea what that's going to look like. You know what I mean? We weren't making any money either. Yeah. So it was um, so so. With that being said, it was kind of at uh, Bones and I were driving the ship at that. You don't drive ships, do you? <laughs> so we we, uh, <laughs> we were driving the car and on this, and it was important for us to have a couple of producers. I know it's a long answer, but I was trying I know, to give you more of an explanation of. So Devin's role was more of a fifth band member. Mm -hmm. He was playing keys and c helping us with vocals and all kinds of stuff. He actually did end up co-producing the record because uh, Daniel, uh, he's Swedish. Mm -hmm. We flew him over from Sweden and he, he, like a lot of Scandinavians, had a kind of a, not, I wouldn't generalize, <laughs> but he has more of a reserved personality. He wasn't this big, he didn't have that producer, that, that that stereotypical producer's role of where he was dictating this and this, he was kind of quiet. Right. And Dan, I mean, and Devin knew somebody's got to step up yeah, and right. take some leadership of this thing because all of us, you know, this is only our second record. We didn't quite know how this is all, it's like your second girlfriend. I kind of know what's going on because of my first girlfriend, but I still don't have enough experience to know should I be mad at this guy for not leading? <laughs> you know, like I don't really, but Devin had worked with Steve Vai. Oh. So he had some experience. So he was the one guy in the room who said, listen, let me step in because we literally were spending uh, hours just on f getting microphones on a snare drum. Pa, 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 three hours later, pa, pa. And you know, it was like, in, Devin was just like, this is, this is not that kind of record, you know what I mean? So it was great that he was there. Did he speed up the process after that? I had mean, you're to, You're not hitting yes. the snare drum for an hour? Here. Absolutely, yeah, had to because, um, you know, Daniel just, Daniel was, uh, had, had a lot of these traits of, he was a studio guy, he was a gear guy. But, but producers uh, back then, uh, especially for indie metal bands, usually wore two roles. They were the engineer and they were the producer, they were doing both. So it, it, the problem was is that uh, Daniel wasn't the taskmaster, he wasn't the leader. Like, so the, the producer has to be a coach and he also has to have a grand vision of the sound of the record and how to shape the album, but he didn't have the taskmaster side. So Devin came in and, and just said, hey, um, do you mind? And he, the, the two of those guys clicked well and they, they fit great. They were opposite sides of a puzzle piece because Devin has this huge personality and he, he, he can, you know, he can, captivate a room with ideas and he's just a genius and Daniel may have been a genius but I will never know because he never you know what I mean he was so slow and methodical he was more of a scientist wow yeah. okay and your next one uh Ryzen yeah going through it I love this record this is great <laughs> so crazy because then again pig walk okay so snapping next super into funk rock and 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 exploring those things Pig Walk, I was like, I had just discovered Sepultura and Pantera and like all these super heavy bands like Fear Factory. And then um, after that record, like I really started getting into heavy blues stuff like Deep Purple and <laughs> you could hear the, like, you could hear the change on every record, right? It's like, 
you know, I can always hear these, you know, people like saying, oh, I wonder what Rich is going to do this. To, who is he listening to <laughs> now? Because, and you have to think, I'm still in my mid, early, mid 20s. So I'm still figuring out, you know, all of these influences that I love and I'm listening to ZZ Top and I'm listening to, you know, Ted Nugent again. It's like some of these kind of classic influences that I grew up with. What's cool is that you, it's like you doing that. It's not a record company saying, hey, Rich, this has got to be bluesy, but it's like you deciding this influenced me, so I'm going to do this. That's yeah. pretty neat. You know? yeah, no, there was nobody there. That was the best thing about being on an independent label is everybody I know that's signed to a major label. There's a guy in the back going, yeah, we're not really hearing a single on this one. Like they didn't care about singles because they didn't, they didn't really think that we were a candidate for radio. Um, we got lucky in that I had this idea uh, to do a, a I, would, I started getting into wrestling, thus the wrestling belt. When you're on tour, uh, you can ask any musician, um, you have a few options because you only get to play, if you're the opening band, you're 30 minutes to 45 minutes. If you're the headliner, you're um, 75 minutes or an hour and a half. If you're, you know, uh, <laughs> if you're Bruce Springsteen, you're four hours, but no one wants to hear a heavy metal band in a club for four hours. You know what I mean? Like, so you're playing 75 or 90 minutes. Then you have to figure out what are you going to do with the rest of your time? Thus, if somebody pats you on the back and tells you you're great, for like 10 years in a row. Cause it, by the time this is 97, we are already in it for eight years or so. And literally, if you're not grounded, dude, you're so great. And the girlfriend is like, dude, you're so Surrounded great. Surrounded by yes men. By yes Everyone people. loves you cause you're in the band, right? Uh, even if you're in a crappy band, people love you. Like you're in a band, man. All right. And, and we were a good band. So we got a lot more of that. And so what ends up happening is you end up either partying and doing drugs and filling your extra time with bad stuff, you know, uh, lots of uh, lots of excess and all the things that'll that will break up a band or cause problems. Or you'll do things like you'll find weird hobbies, like tape trading with people who like wrestling. So I would watch every wrestling program there was: ECW, WWF, WCW, and all their shows. And I was lifting weights and I was obsessed with fitness at the time because 22 and a half hours of like downtime. How did you steer away from all that excess like of partying? Because I, mean, I had to so drive tempting. the vehicle. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah, it's not like we're on a tour bus. We're driving a van. <laughs> the guy, like I already had two guys that were like doing, you know, doing the party thing. Somebody's got to check you into the hotel. Like, you know what I mean? Like, because the other guys are like, having a great time and not to say that being, you know, living, you know, drug and alcohol free and uh, staying faithful to your girlfriend is not fun, but it was like any relationship, you know, you're married, you have kids, mm -hmm. both of you can't be insane. Like, <laughs> like, sure. you know what I mean? Like yeah. somebody has to be the adult and that's no disrespect to the person who's still childlike. Like I'm super childlike to this day. Like I, I'm constantly on eBay at two o'clock in the morning okay. looking for like a, some McFarlane action figure. <laughs> you know, like I'm still obsessed with the same stupid things that I, 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 you know, and I'm still tape trading with people for ECW pay-per-views. I'm just recently did that again. Like I still like that stuff. My wife has to be responsible. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to. And that's part of the reason why I didn't, um, it was through necessity. Right, if everyone's partying, how are you getting to the next gig? That's really what it comes down to. And we've been in a couple of van accidents letting crew guys drive. I'm not ever gonna let a crew guy drive again because I don't wanna die, you know? And I'm not saying that, that I'm a better driver than anybody else, but I, I, I've already experienced what it's like to be in the back of a van and be heading off the side of a road thinking, ah, well, it was good while it lasted. <laughs> and, and so I started getting paranoid about our safety. Um, and I also, some of the crew guys were partying too, but they would just lie about it. I didn't know who was doing what. I knew I could control. And that's the one thing I grew up, my mom was, an air, uh, was, a, was a military brat. And uh, when, if I, my elbows were ever on the table, my mom would turn the knife around and swap my hand. There was discipline in my house. And the one thing I learned was, if you want to be successful in life, the little things matter, you know? That like, seems so hard though. Thinking about playing a gig, 
coming off stage and showering and driving the van for how many hours? That's some showering. Oh uh, yeah. Where are you gonna do that? We crack the window. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, this, drive off to the next gig. Yeah, and that's it. And the thing is, though, I always kind of tell people. Part of the reason I think that Stuck Mojo was so successful during that little window was because we lived like animals. And um, we were super jealous of other bands that while we were doing this, they were like, woohoo! Like bands just flying past Seven us. Does. Dude, yeah. they were like, and the thing was is that I would quietly grumble about it out of envy, because envy is like, part of all of us, right? I mean, I, and there were other bands that I would see coming out. I mean, remember, I knew Fred Durst when he was 19 years old in a cover band in Jacksonville. And I remember seeing them in, in New York City in 96. And I remember Wes coming up to me and saying, hey man, we just got signed. I said, what's your band name? He's like, Limp Biscuit." I remember thinking, that's a terrible name. <laughs> it's never gonna happen. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I knew Fred because Fred's band, who was a cover band at the time, and he was singing, he wasn't even rapping. I mean, he loved Bones, man. Uh, listen, I'm not disrespecting him at all, because listen, when I first saw Zach Wild play guitar, I changed how I played guitar. It's the same thing. When Fred Durst saw Bones, it made a change. Like, sometimes you have these big things in your life where you see somebody that you connect with, and it resonates resonates so much that it makes you rethink things. So I see, you know, Limp Biscuit and I. 311 too, didn't you guys have a sold out crowd to that? I've heard that. Yeah, but 311 was already kind of, they were already above us at the time. I mean, they, they you know, actually 311 helped us out quite a bit. They let us open for them a few times. I, I, I think them being cool to us helped us quite a bit. But I think part of, um, part of seeing these other bands, uh, climb the mountain with a little less headwind because they had record companies putting lots of money into there on the radio and they were in on a tour bus on their first tour. I remember we were touring with, uh, we were opening for Typo Negative. We were main support, three band bill, and there was a band called Drain STH. They were all chick band, remember them mm -hmm. from Sweden. They were in a massive tour bus with all these crew guys. We were in a, a crappy little <laughs> van pulling a trailer. That you're driving. That I was driving. <laughs> and then typo negative in two buses. And I remember just thinking, uh, just, you know, just how that just, all of that scenario just made me work harder. It didn't make me like wanna go flatten the tires. It'd be good for them. You know what I mean? It's like, I wasn't mad at them. I didn't hate them. I was happy for Seven Dust. It was just that my uh, undeveloped brain couldn't figure out what it was about Seven Dust that got them there so much faster than Stuck Mojo. And now, I, now I, it's a little clearer to me because honestly they had better songs. You know, they had big, hor uh, big you know, hooky choruses. I mean, they were a great band. Like I was, in my mind at that time, it was all about who is the best live band and listen to our production and listen to these riffs and stuff. But until you get older, you don't get to see the, the bigger production. I mean, the bigger kind of picture of things because um, you know, you just don't have the wisdom. I mean, in a lot of ways, Seven Dust was a much better, you know, suited band for success than Stuck Mojo. We, uh, you know, I think we were a great band, but we were, we were gonna, always gonna be a little bit like Fugazi in that we were gonna have this kind of legendary following and that we were gonna do big business in the venues, but we weren't gonna sell tons of albums until Rising. And that was a cool thing. And then Rising came out and we did this wrestling video all the way around. Sorry, I went 10 miles down this road. Um, and then, Diamond Dallas Page got involved, Raven got involved, all of the WCW, they love this idea of doing this music video and they did a, a, an, a wrestling angle against Diamond Dallas Page and Raven and the, and the kind of genesis of that angle was that DDP and was gonna be part of this video and fight Raven in the, in the music video and they aired it on Monday Nitro when Nitro was the biggest thing in cable television and overnight we went from you know, selling out, you know, 600 seaters in Chicago to selling out 1,200 seaters in Chicago. I remember seeing um, DDP, uh, Diamond Dallas Page on Carson, I think it was like TRL or something, yes. and he was talking about you yeah. guys on YouTube. And I, Dave Grohl was on there with him. Yeah, sitting next to him. I was right? just like, yeah, I was like, well, we've made it. <laughs> but we didn't. But, it, you know, what is making it, and then that's that whole sidebar. It's, it, it, again, it's like, when you're looking up here, and then I never looked down and looked at these other hundred bands that were 
as good as we were, if not better, who had great things that just didn't shoot the gap and weren't able to get their little shot. I mean, we were lucky. We were in the right place at the right time. Our demo got in the hands of a producer in South Florida named Scott Burns, who had produced Obituary and Sepultura. And then he forwarded to Monty Connor and Monty Connor worked at Roadrunner, but he had just signed Dog Eat Dog, so he didn't want another rap rock band, and he gave it to Bory Vorkurgan at Century Media and said, this band is super hot, this demo is super cool, and they signed us. Like, how, like, how did, I mean, we got lucky. You know what I mean? Our tape, our three song well, it's, demo it's tape. More, it's more than luck though. You guys worked really, really hard. We you did, know. but it takes that little, right? I yeah. mean, the other, like how many college football, I mean, you know, college football players that had all the talent, but maybe just the right recruiter didn't see them or they had a bad senior year because of an injury. Like we just got, there was enough hard work and a little bit of luck that, uh, you know, Weren't you guys almost on capital? Is that the recommend? I think it, yeah, yes and no. Uh, there was like, uh, so the, originally it was Zoo Entertainment that had Tool uh, who wanted to sign. And then it w went to Pavement Records. Pavement put us in the, in the uh, studio to record Snap and Necks. And uh, then when it was, comes time to, to pay the first deposit, they never did. And, this is a long story short, but the, we ended up on Century Media. The big one was Mercury. Mercury. Okay. Yes, That's what Mercury I'm was the big, li we were actually on tour on the rising, uh, we had graduated to a motorhome. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was driving that too. <laughs> <laughs> and we were playing in New York City and uh, I, uh, Danny Goldberg, who was the head of Mercury and his assistant, I can't remember what her name was, but she was the VP at uh, Mercury, both came to the show. And uh, after the show, she came on the bus and just, um, motorhome, and uh, look at me, I'm trying to up my status, uh, <laughs> yeah. and said, you guys were amazing. I can't even believe what I saw. We had a sold out show in the city. And she was like, we're gonna sign you. We gotta work out the details with Century Media. And uh, like, I was just like, there's no way. It's like, this, this, we can't go to a major label. How is this possible? Like, you know, because I, for so many years, had been, you know, sleeping five guys in one hotel room where we would rotate who slept on the floor, you know, two guys in each bed. You know, like we lived that way for so many years um, that it almost like just felt like it was never going to happen, nor should it, because there was something about being that prize fighter where we were, we were so good, and part of that being so good was the adversity of it, the no sleep, the no food, the no money. What keeps you going during all that? I mean, it's wanting like to be the best. Passion, yeah, right? that's yeah. it. That's it. it it's, it's almost like you write a book about that, like how to survive, you know, like, cause you did it all back in the early days. Yeah, and, and I think it was that, I mean, we didn't get along as a band. I mean, there was lots of, it's well documented. But that who does? I mean, most bands nobody. do. Nobody. But since you're signed, it's document. Like everybody knows about it. That's now. exactly I've right. I've heard Dave Grohl talk about that before. It's, when it's, they're going through their breakups. And isn't it crazy? Like, and the thing is, is that I thought it was just us because, you know, you you live in your own bubble, right? We all live in our own little bubble, and then you tour with uh, Typo Negative, and you see, oh, those guys don't hang out. And then you tour with Machine Head and, oh, those guys don't hang out. And then you tour with Pantera and Phil rides on the bus with the crew. Oh, those guys don't hang out. Like, you start noticing, oh, the Life of Agony guys, oh, they don't hang out. As a matter of fact, uh, every, we, we shared a tour. A lot of these tours, we would share buses. Like, we shared a, a tour bus with Life of Agony in 96 in Europe, or 90, yeah, 96. And, uh, and I would just sit up in the back lounge sitting with Alan, the bass player, every night because he was married and happy and he wasn't gonna go out and take every mushroom and <laughs> eat strange baked goods from whoever, <laughs> some fan that showed up. He's just a normal guy, right? He just loves music. And we just would sit there and talk, but he didn't, it wasn't like he, there was connection, like there was on stage, but, and I started recognizing, I was like, okay, not every great sports franchise has to be best friends and go to the Outback, you know, after sound check to have, you know, crappy steaks. Everybody can, um, you, you, you can determine what, and the same with Zeppelin and all these, none of these Beatles. I mean, there's so many examples of bands who, yeah. they don't like each other. So they're not friends, it's more like coworkers. Yeah, like and they know ke chemistry, right? It's like, dude, you look at all these sports franchises and, 
you know, you, you put the five greatest basketball players on the court, doesn't mean they're going to play well together, <laughs> you know? All right, going to this live album, I was actually at the show, which I'm very oh, wow, proud of. very cool. amazing, yeah. Um, what made you guys decide you want to capture the live experience on an album? I wish you guys had this document like on DVD or something. Me man, too, be man. You know, it was, that was a great night though. We, we, actu we actually have, um, we, we always used to talk about, we got to film all this stuff. And then you'd price it out, what it costs to bring the truck out. It like, oh my God, it's like <laughs> 20 grand just to bring the truck out. <laughs> you know, like, cause back then, you know, digital wasn't really a format yet. We're st everybody's really still filming Super 16 and everything was super <laughs> expensive. Yeah. yeah like. <laughs> And uh, oh, I remember just editing. I, I edited the rising video, like because we didn't have anybody could we could afford it, you know. So um, no, that's cool. Yeah, I love this, and it's so cool that you were there. Oh man, I haven't yeah. seen the back of it in so long. Yeah, I love uh, the uh, it dates it because you talk about Bill Clinton and stuff. Oh, <laughs> that's I know. It's yeah. really cool, man. I know. I, I, it's funny. I, I oh look, produced by Andy Sneap. Yeah. Current guitar player of Judas Priest. He is. Yeah. Who I went to go see uh, a month ago. Did you? I flew out to Dallas to see the show. Amazing. See your buddy who that's produced all your records. That's some, that's some heavy name dropping, man. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's freaking the sneakster. These, these songs you added, this is getting kind of nerdy, but I love the uh, Reborn and all this stuff. That's really cool. Did you guys record it just to add on to this live record? Yes. Yeah, the, the, that was a Century Media requirement. Oh, okay. Yeah, they were like, we, we want to legit bonus tracks mm. so uh that were studio versions and 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 i actually think reborn could be one of our better songs I of all song. time yeah it's a great song and it was great because it was like bones at his most kind of uh you know vulnerable talking about himself a little bit you know about having a, a son now and you know like having his life is changing is like those are great moments before we were just kind of talking here comes the monster we're the greatest band ever it was like boast rap stuff a lot of our stuff was because bones was a product of boast rap era right because you were there was only two types of rap gangster rap and boast rap like no one talked about fat asses yet <laughs> that was yet money that was yet to come so it was all about but we're the greatest or i'm gonna shoot you so we stuck mainly to we're the greatest yeah and then like he that was like a really cool moment i thought wow and, and you, you know, when you're collaborating in the writing stage, um, it's nice when someone gives you something that's kind of more personal and then I could write something that was, a, I thought, a little more melodic. Did you do most of the writing or did Bones write a little bit or is that? Bones writes up until, up until, I mean, all of Snapping Necks and all of Pig Walk, Bones wrote every word for the most part, and there may have been kind of in the rehearsal space, what if you did this? Some collaborative, but it was never, he had his notebooks of rhymes and, and I wrote all the music. They were, actually, that's not true. Corey wrote Despise on Pig Walk. There may have been another song as well. Yeah, I mean, Snapping Next was- I got the list right here if you wanna. Ah, uh, yeah, that Despise was definitely him because it is very, very uh, Lowry. Anyone who knows the Lowry's, they have a sound, how they play. It is it is a total, you hear the riff in it, you're like, eh, it's a Lowry, <laughs> it, which is great. Uh, I think the rest of them are mine. But um, uh, yeah, I think so. But um, But by that time, Corey had left because Corey left to join Life of Agony. Um, and so we recorded Heavy One with Dan Dryden. Uh, and Dan Dryden then became kind of, it was great because it, the interesting thing about Heavy One was that when Corey left, Corey and I had gone on a, on a walk. Um, we were on tour with Seven Dust and it was Seven Dust and Clutch. And we were, I believe we were in San Diego Something like that, I don't remember. I, I think it was San Diego. We went for a walk and we were both like, Corey and, and Bones were, uh, had a little bit of friction because Bones had allowed that frustration of the uh, deal with um, Mercury, Mercury falling apart. It was all eating at us, but it was really, it was Bones is, what makes Bones an amazing artist and makes him such a great entertainer is that he's super emotional. So he goes from zero to 10 
so fast, but that's why he's great. It's the same with Phil and Selmo and Danzig and all, all like you don't want a boy scout as your front man. You just don't, you want someone who, who has something going on in, internally that makes them be able to go immediately from, you know, I'm in fight or flight mode. You know what I mean? Like he was great at that. Uh, and so, and I, I think, I think Bones had made a couple of comments, um, which had made Corey mad about, um, about seven dust. You know, he was like, Hey, it's my brother, man. You know, like, come on, man. You know, I was like, I, I get it. We all are frustrated about things. It's like, you know, everybody wants the best for all of us, but yes, yeah, my brother, you know, kind of, that should be off the table. And I, and I think all the, fr all that frustration, Corey and I, we went on this walk and we were talking about, should we just start another band? Like it was that, that where we just questioning everything, right? Like you don't, because sometimes um, it's the same with, with politics and same with religion and, and whatever your family, when you are so isolated on this island and all you know is what you're going through and you don't have anything outside of the 10 minutes before or after, like we have no plans in the future because we're living literally gig to gig. We don't know what the next tour is. We don't know Century Media could drop us at any minute. We're at the mercy of that. Yes, Good. and you're seeing other people rise and you're staying at that level. Correct. It's be frustrating. Yeah. yeah, then all of a sudden you're seeing these other bands. That was like, then it became the 90s where everyone had a rapper and it was all this rap rock stuff and everything was happening. And it you was- you guys bitter about that a little bit? Like, at the time we weren't because we thought we were better than ever all the rest of them. It, whether we were or not, it didn't matter. It was just like, in our mind, we'd get in the van and just like, oh, this guy's so, you know, you're like, you know, like, it, it's the, it's the same thing that I guess MMA fighters do. It's right, you know, they, uh, he got a title, so I could kick his ass. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's what all people in their 20s do, especially dudes when they have this massive amount of testosterone and you're in a band and you never sleep or eat, you know what I mean? And you're, three albums into your career and you've sold close to a million do a million albums and you're still living in a one bedroom apartment with your girlfriend and you have an old 1982 Honda Civic hatchback. Like, like it's the ultimate in, uh, uh, when keeping it real goes wrong. Like you just can't quite process it. Every, no one can understand like, I was never embarrassed. I always was poor and never had money. My, my, my sister and I shared a room when I was growing up. And then when my sister got her own room, my mom got remarried and, and then I had a stepbrother and we had bunk beds. I was 17 years old and had bunk beds and I never, we never had money. We didn't have cable television until I was just turned 17. So like having a 1982 Honda Civic, it didn't bother me. What bothered me is that everyone else thought it was weird. Like, like what's going on? Like then you start having people telling you, they must be stealing money from you. Something like, they, you know what I mean? Like yeah. why, where's all that money going and this and that? And even though like you can look at the, you can look at the ledgers, I mean, it's all there and counted for. You start questioning everything and then Corey and I just decided maybe we should just start another band. We talked about working with Donnie Hamby from uh, Double Drive. Um, and then we talked about before, um, Eric Rogers, we talked about possibly working with him. Wow, that's cool, I never knew that. Yeah, yeah, yeah this, nobody does. I never even talked about this before, <laughs> but like, this is like- Exclusive. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, it's like, we're friends, yes. I, you know, I feel, and, and, you know, so long story short was, I got a call one day from, um, uh, God, I can't, I, I forget. I got a call from a friend who just said, hey, I heard that Corey is going to be in Life of Agony. And I was like, I mean, it's possible, but I feel like Corey would have talked yeah. to me about it. Uh, and it made sense though, because Corey and I had just two or three months earlier had this long walk where we're talking about, should we start our own band? And I think that kind of opened the door to maybe this thing doesn't have a, a long shelf life because once you start talking about starting side projects, Put that seed, yes. That seed. And, no. and I called him and I left him a voicemail message. Just said, dude, listen, I'll stand on the front row and watch you play with life agony. I don't hold any animosity. Just let me know what's going on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just so I, I will know. And when Corey left, I thought, mm, this could be it. And I'm, 
I met, is, uh, 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 yeah, and I met Dan Dryden, and he came in, and he, his bass playing and his singing, like it made me feel like, oh, because he's very different from Corey, yeah. but just uh, better in some ways, not as great in, in other ways, but made me feel like we weren't going to lose anything because uh, even though Dan didn't have the uh, the personality, like Corey's a rock star. He's an yeah. absolute star. And Dan Dryden uh, as a performer is not Corey Lowry. But Dan Dryden as a bass player and a singer brought things that uh, were different than what Corey had brought. And it allowed me to then start writing more melodic stuff as a juxtaposition to Bones' rapping, because even though I, I love singing and I think I'm an okay singer, I was much better at the barky oh, vocal yeah. stuff than I was, and then all of a sudden, I could bark, Bones could rap, Dan could sing, and then to me, I, I, like, I get more comments over the years of, this is my favorite Stuck Mojo record from so many people, because it really was, um, uh, Again, nothing like Rising, completely different. No Southern rock stuff on here. This was like a super aggressive, super pissed off record. And it was like, uh, anyone who knows me, and I've talked about it, like I'm a bit of an anomaly in the, in the music uh, business in that like, I'm, I'm super, I'm way far to the right uh, politically uh, than George Bush or uh, any right wing politician that you can think of when it comes to economic stuff. And then I'm farther than Bernie Sanders is to the left when it comes to social issues. And which is ripe for the picking for music. Like, but you know, because it was so different, like we could write we could talk about things that, I mean, literally, they, they, this cover was, they wouldn't let us put it out in Europe. Oh, really? oh yeah, we had a different album cover in Europe because they're like, you can't put a gun on a cover. It's like, <laughs> why? It's like, you can't. People are thinking to think you guys are insane. And I wonder if you could do that now. It seems like, cause now it's getting to the same guns or a lot of people are against guns now. I wonder if it kind of come full circle. Yeah, like, I mean, you know, I think, in 2018, you can't put a gun on. It depends <laughs> on where we are in the boogeyman cycle. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it was great for us because we did the American flag. And, and the great thing about it is, is that we even started popping bigger in Europe because people love things that are culturally different from what they're used to, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the reason why kids in the suburbs love hip hop stuff because it's different, <laughs> yeah. right? It's taboo. Like you go on stage, like I don't know if you remember seeing photographs, our backdrop for Stuck Mojo during this period of time was a massive American flag and a massive Georgia state flag, which was basically the rebel flag on either side. And, and, and it was, it was like, and having a black front man rapping super right of center vocals uh, content was just crazy. And again, it energized us. Like we were like, okay, we're good. And then all of a sudden we would go on tour and bands like you'd see guys from In Flames, like every band, like we were kind of becoming what King's X was uh, to that kind of, our entire audience was musicians. Like, you know what I mean? Like the guy, I, I went to see Pantera at the Tabernacle and they were playing this album as their set change music oh, declaration. Cool. Like, not because, because they loved it. Like, and, and that made me proud because there are a lot of people who are closet, you know, I mean, you're not even allowed to say that you own a gun anymore. Uh, it's an inanimate object, it's like a lawnmower. Like, I could kill somebody much more effectively with a lawnmower. <laughs> but there are some things you can't say, and we said them. And especially in the entertainment business where you're not allowed to. Like, there's a, there's a firewall that says, you can't believe in God. You can't, you can't have right of center ideas on economics. And, and we did, and it was great. And that's what got us through the losing Corey Lowry was that we had met Dan Dryden and, uh, and he injected this new sense of melody and his playing was, he has such a great tone. He was such a great player. And then this, ability to take what we had done on Pig Walk and Rising, where we were kind of spicing the politics in, and this whole record is just basically, I mean, we, the intro is basically- I was ask you that. Who, where did you get that from? Like that, vo that girl saying, hello, this That's is. Andy Sneap's girlfriend. Oh, is it? Yeah, <laughs> so that's Andy Sneap, 
me and Andy Sneap's oh, girlfriend. Folks. That's, that's me. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then Andy Sneap plays the other guy. So <laughs> was we, that a one take or did a one did, take? Yeah. Did you have your, your words in front of you? Just saying, no. We were, we had an outline, but we kind of that's knew. amazing. Yeah. I mean, we that's were the just thing it was great, own. and you know, and Andy and I had, you know. Andy was like one of those big, the topics on this record, uh, if I was to break them down and discuss them, most of them are things that everybody's like, meh, I get it. Uh, you, know, uh, the, you know, you're not allowed to say it, but if you have a personal conversation and a road trip to Panama City, you, you probably find 95% of it, you know, even people who disagree on fundamentally on things, they're, they're just working class ideas. And I felt like it resonated with a lot of people. And then the people that pissed off was good. Like, yeah. yeah. I remember we got a one out of five stars in Metal Hammer magazine <laughs> just because we had guns in the photo. It's like, same thing. Nothing ever changes, right? It's like, um, you know, you didn't even listen to it. You don't care. How did you guys go from a high, because the sound was so big, to that's the last Stuck Mojo record. I mean, not, you have other stuff after that, but it was a long gap right there. I mean, is it, because you went from a high, it almost, it seemed like you would follow it up with another record to We should have, we should have. That the thing was, is that was another kind of um, me being young and I was really, I was super overly confident at that point. My playing was really good. I had guys like Dimebag and Zach Wilde saying, dude, I love your playing. Like, again, you start getting the guys who are your heroes, who you think are the greatest players on the earth, are now like telling you that they're a fan of your stuff. And like, things just start getting weird. Like, um, the record company, uh, uh, Century Media, the owner of the record company, and I became friends. I did some demos on the side um, with kind of, which was that band, but with Eddie Gowan singing and uh, Century Media, the head of Century Media flew out and offered us a lot of money. And then Spitfire Records owned, offered us a lot of money. And I, I said, I wanna wait for a major label. Like for me, like there was no point in signing another deal with another independent label, this because it was a kind of a melodic rock deal. I wanted it to be more radio. Yeah because that was getting so much reaction and there was so much friction between uh, Bones and I at that time that instead of us trying to figure out how to make this work, and it was mainly on me because Bones was more than happy to kind of just continue on with this kind of weird dynamic where we kind of pretended that we were friends, but we did love each other. I mean, I still love the guy. It's, it's, it's dope. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we did get in a fist fight one time. It was freaking terrible. And I just remember thinking, oh, this is awful. Like, this is, you know. And it, a lot of it comes down to the same stuff that we all go through in life. There's always that guy that you grew up with that you got in a fight with. You're like, why did we do that? It's so still over nothing. You know what I mean? Just like stupid stuff you could have walked away from. Stuff now as a 49 year old man, I would have never done. Uh, which is a lot of the reason why I still don't do it because um, even though there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I love that I love that that lineup and that band. It's still like some of my favorite memories of all time. But at the same time, uh, you know, life is you know, it's everything's finite. I start you start to older you get, you start to realize that, especially when you see like people that you know get killed in a motorcycle accident, or how did one of my best friends just die of cancer at you know, at 50 years old, like, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna do anything that's, I don't mind doing things difficult. Difficult's worth working through, right? Um, stuff that keeps you from being able to sleep, stuff that makes you, like, you can't shake it. Like, I'm, I started taking uh, Advil PM every night for like five years, just because, I know, like, dude, I'm such a drug addict. <laughs> but literally, like, I, I, I'm starting to take pills to like go to bed you know, and some nights waking up four hours later and taking another one because I'm, because it's driving me crazy. Just that tension. Needed, right? Yeah, the tension. So that's why, that's why I just said, and uh, at that time I was doing the bulk of the work. I really was. I mean, I owned the studio. I was doing all the songwriting and like a good frontman, it's like nothing that Bones had to do. Like 
I had these weird expectations of like, why aren't you helping? It's like, he's really doing all he can. Like, he's the front man, he shows up, he's got a microphone, he kicks ass, okay? Now he does his thing. Like, but because I had assumed the role of the dude who did everything else, then all of a sudden I'm looking at all of these things and it was, it was, an, it was a totally unhealthy way of looking at, at things and I, I blame myself a lot for that because Bones was unaware of it. I remember the one time we played in New York City on that Seven Dust tour and I was driving a motor home, a 35 foot motor home with a 16 foot trailer and the 16 foot trailer plus the tow hitch through the city. Oh, like I was literally like, oh, about to have a heart attack, about to stroke out because like cars are so close to each other. I'm in midtown Manhattan. I'm going crazy. And Bones and Corey were riding a lot on the seven dust bus because, you know, riding in the motorhome is not as fun. And I'm driving it. And I remember them. I was trying to find a parking place. I had la lapped the the venue like four times. And I remember just seeing those guys. They were walking together, had pizza and they were waving to me. It's like, fuck you and your fucking pizza. <laughs> like I was so mad because oh, yeah. like I'm driving all over <laughs> gear, like get me a parking spot. Like, you know, one of those things where you just, instead of thinking, man, I should just, I should just hire a driver. Like, so, like, you know what I mean? Like all of this stuff was stuff that I put on the table just based on, I want to control of the wheel. I want to control of the songwriting. I want to control of this and that. And, uh, you know, luckily Corey, he's a great songwriter and he participated a bunch on, on Rising, which, was, which is good. Cause I mean, I needed a partner musically to work with. And then Dan Dryden was the partner that I worked with obviously on Declaration. And I work with Dan on the Fozzie stuff as well and the Six Beat. I mean, he was a big part of, he was a big part of that kind of transition. Let's talk about that, Six Speed. Crazy story on this. So Six Speed never made an album. Six Speed uh, recorded like, 40 songs in demo forms and I had three different lineups and I was just trying to figure out what am I do, going to do with all this stuff because I was selling CDs at the shows so it was like like in the old days like oh, this is demo one demo two demo three version you know was like this online did online start by all this yes this time? yes okay. so I was selling some stuff online but mainly at shows um and then I had a guy uh who worked for a record company who said, hey man, I could, I could probably make you some cash in Europe and get you a tour in Europe. And I was like, wow, all right, well that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and this is, remember, I had turned down these other independent deals thinking I was gonna get a major label deal. And then 9-11 happened and then the entire industry kind of retracted. I was married, uh, there was no stuck mojo. Fozzie was a super part-time band and Six Speed was making okay money. But like all of a sudden it was the first time in my life where I went from making very little money to making no money because we weren't working. Like it's not like there's a, it's not like there's some kind of like salary musicians get. You, you know, play chord, get check. Like, you know, like yeah. no play chord, no get check. And, and so I was thinking, okay, I, and I had paid for all these, okay, and I was, I paid Andy Sneap to mix them. Like I was paying for studio time. This, this is back when studios were a thousand dollars a day. It wasn't like I had a laptop in my, in my house. We we're making records, you know? Yeah. And didn't so. you guys have a lot of heavy hitters hitting you up to sign you with this album? Of course. And then nine, you said nine 11 happens and then everything. Yes. Comments. Everything stopped. And then I was begging the it's people. It was, it was <laughs> okay. So true story. Uh, we had a show uh, at, uh, at CBGB's uh, on Friday night, the, I believe it was the 14th of September, wow. 2001. And that was our big showcase we've been working up. We had, a, we had this great new attorney, we had all this, I mean, I'm not kidding, it couldn't have been like more strange in that this was the chance that we really had. And then at the time we didn't see it as Oh, we just thought, okay, we'll reschedule. I mean, God, I, I don't want to make this terrible event where all these pe thousands of people died about me. Because at the time, I didn't, I didn't process it as the music industry is going to go away for a year and the American economy was going to go away for a while. And that things were, I was just thinking, we'll reschedule the show. You know, it's n no big deal. God, the, you know, you're more kind of thinking about 
what does this mean to New York City and all these people? And, you know, obviously it changed America. So then six months later, I'm begging these companies, sign, can you please <laughs> sign six feet? I'll, t I'll take anything, a box of frickin' Ritz crackers, anything, nothing. It was done. It was, and then, um, you know, then I changed the name of the band to Cafu just to try to erase oh, the slate. See, I remember them. Yeah, I was like, I have to change the name because uh, I, I feel like I, 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 then we were out there, we had all this momentum, things that, and once the momentum's done, mm -hmm. once, once the girl's not asked to be danced with anymore and she's sitting at the bar, nobody's asking. It's like, <laughs> she must have <laughs> yeah, bad breath or she's there. a terrible dancer or something, right? Yeah. So, Cafu, you guys, I remember you had that song, It Takes Two to Make Things Go Right. Like, didn't you read yes, that? Yes, we sure did. That yes. Is, yeah. yeah, so That's we, a, yeah. On YouTube. <laughs> yeah, the, the YouTube. I can never pronounce that right because I always say, is it calf? Like, I always said it wrong, but calf you. I get yeah. it. And so, long story short, was the guy in Europe um, was going to get me some money to do this. Um, I never signed the deal for this album. I never gave him permission to do this, and they released it anyway. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I have a few boxes of those at my house, uh, of those CD, and, but it was basically a bootleg. I never saw any money for it. Yeah. I never knew that. Yeah. I've been, I've been ripped off a couple of times, pretty grand. Um, but, and I didn't feel too terrible about that one. It kind of helped me. I mean, got a record out, you know, it, it was only available for a short period of time, but you know, at least, at least there is a, 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 a an umbrella that has those songs in it. Exactly. Yeah. And so now you guys, you hooked up with uh, Chris Jericho and you guys were kind of like still Panther, right? Like kind of a, yes. Um, and you guys did cover songs. You did two albums. I don't know which one came first, but both. Yeah, yeah. That was the first album. This is the second album. This was 2000. And I think this was 2003, I believe. This has four originals. That has two originals. The idea of the originals was just we were playing this Steel Panther. Um, we went we went one step beyond what Steel Panther is, which is that we actually went Spinal Tap, where we made up a story. Like we, you know, we were not even, you know, Steel Panther uses fake names and they have, you know, they have their shtick, but we actually f made a movie. I love that movie. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. The it was hilarious, movie. it was great. I mean, but MTV, it was, that's the crazy thing, is like our, our Fozzie movie was on MTV, it was a 30 minute film, um, and they played it probably 25 or 30 times. It was like, <laughs> like, like, I finally made it to MTV with like, but now I'm in a cover band, like wearing, you know, leather pants and uh, have a fake name. It's like super, you never know what's what going to happen. What was your happen. fake name? Duke LaRue. Did your parents call that? No, I kind of wish. I <laughs> wish it had been much cooler. Cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, is that at the time, that was kind of our fun side cover band. Like, I never thought Chris would want to not be a wrestler and be a rock guy. I love that you guys played shows, too, with, like, random people, right? Like, Fozzie Osborne, that was your name. Yeah. Wasn't it? And you had, I heard somewhere you had Butch Walker. Yeah. Like, we, that's cool. We had a show where it was Clint, uh, Butch Walker, a couple of the guys from Miller's Tale. I mean, we, we like, it was basically, it was an umbrella band, Fozzie Osborne. It was a cover band for all the local Atlanta guys. That was my idea. Was to, I, love, I love 80s metal. Priest, Maiden, Accept, pre, you know, uh, you know Motley Crue, Striper. We never played a Striper song because you could never find anybody who could sing like Michael. <laughs> um, but we would play like the more kind of, you know, the standards, you know what I mean, of, of the 80s metal stuff. And we played, we played it. And then I met Jericho backstage at, um, I believe it was San Antonio. Um, I, was, I was as a guest of Diamond Dallas Page. And uh, I met Jericho backstage, and he was like, dude, I saw you guys with uh, Testament in Orlando like two years ago. You guys are great in Stuck Mojo. And I was like, we, we just had this kinship. We both love Striper. And this is back when you couldn't say it out loud. Yeah. He's like, I like Striper. <laughs> yeah, like, because, it, you know, it was the 90s early. It wasn't cool. And it was seriously not cool. <laughs> I didn't care because I, I've never been afraid to say I still love Dokken. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, this music I grew up I grew up on these bands. Um, uh, and I still think Striper's one of the best bands on the planet. I, you know, they get, they get a bad rap for, you know, because... Their new album. It's the same thing. as like, dude, Nickelback is as good as any band on the planet. They make great records. You don't like them. Whatever. Same with Striper. I get it. They're the punching bag. Mm -hmm. You know? It's a shame. I hate it. Uh, but long story short was, 
we, we started a band and uh, Michael Alago, who had this, the new film, weird how all of this stuff, Seven Degrees of Kevin Bacon, uh, you know, like all of these like, so Michael Alago signed us to Megaforce Records. They spent, I went, our first photo shoot for Fozzie, there was $10,000 catering spread. I was like, I never even, like, we were in a studio. <laughs> like, it was, yeah. hold on, see this? This was in the woods behind the studio. <laughs> and I don't remember who took the picture, but it's like up until the, look, how hold much, on. How much catering did you have in this picture? <laughs> it was a, one of those nature granola, bar, <laughs> granola bars, okay? This picture here, like the big group photo that this came from, was shot in the aerobics room of Main Event Fitness, where we all used to work out our gym. Um, so uh, I'm used to, when you take a photo shoot, you know, there's no budget. So you just like, you find a local photographer who you could pay a couple hundred bucks for. Uh, there was no editing back then. Not really. I mean, you know, like you could, you could do some editing in the processing. You know, there's no digital editing. So we showed up and it was like, there were props and there was this huge catering spread. And then we did a movie. And I remember the, I was arguing with the director uh, who did the Fozzie movie and, uh, just about a, 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 some, his, some of his direction. God was questioning it. And he was like, you're not the one who's shooting 60 frames per second spending $125,000 on this and that. And I was like, then I asked the manager, I was like, how much are we spending on this film? I was like, oh, $200,000 on a film? Like we spent so, I remember the first time I ever got any money, like, like, I got money. They gave me money to make this album. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And I don't mean a little bit. I mean, I made, now listen, it's not, it's not Motley Crue money, but I remember thinking, wow, like the, I made more money in, in that, making that record than I had made probably ever in one fiscal year of Stuck Mojo. And that's what made me just so confused about it was that I didn't even take, this band was a cover band. We never even rehearsed. We just go play, we don't, not, we don't play well. We weren't even a good band. Right. Like, but you had the big name front in your band, the Chris Jericho. Of, but he wasn't even Chris Jericho at that point. Oh, Remember, yeah, yeah. he was a cruiserweight coming out of WCW. He had just gotten into the WWF. Like, the, like he really wasn't, I mean, he was known. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But so was Stuck Mojo was known. It, we were like both kind of these mid-card guys. Jericho was a well-known wrestler. He wasn't, he wasn't Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know, or Shawn Michaels or Bret Hart, you know what I mean? And Stuck Mojo wasn't Seven Dust or Limp Biscuit. We were these two kind of mid-card folks to use that kind of vernacular. And we, and I think people just thought, oh, this could be really cool. They love the idea of the costumes and this could be kind of like Spinal Tap. We're gonna do a Spinal Tap-ish movie. Um, and it did well. I mean, it, it actually sold a lot of records, uh, especially by today's standards. Mm. And I, I don't think they lost money on it uh, unless, uh, unless you calculate the tremendous amount of money they spent. Good grief. Yeah, but in any case, we had fun. Like it was, nobody argued. It was like, we're in a band where like, when we go travel and go do a thing, everybody's in costumes and wigs and wearing ridiculous outfits and Jericho will not break character. So like, so somebody's like, Jericho! He's like, the guy stole my, you know, he wouldn't even, doesn't even acknowledge it. It was like, he was great. He was, because he was into improv and he got it. So it was a fun band, yeah. That's, that's great stuff. And then before this album, All the Remains, yep. he approached me and, and Jericho did and said, hey man, we should do an original record. I was like, hmm, that means we have to be good. You know, that <laughs> requires rehearsal. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, and, I, and, and he was like, man, we'll do it. I was like, you should, you gotta take vocal lessons. And like, we actually have to do this right. So I mean, cool. we've been bullshitting. Like, you know what I mean? Like we've been doing this for fun. Like Steel Panther is a legit great band. Fozzie was a super entertaining band, but we were definitely a solid six out of 10 on execution. <laughs> like it may have been super entertaining, but you can go look on YouTube and look at some of the videos. It's like, mm, that's not very good. But it was because Jericho was a full-time wrestler and we had other bands, you know? We, you know, 
we were, I was still working on, I was working on my solo record. I was working on Six Speed still or Cafu. Like I was actively, because I never thought this Fozzy, F-O-Z-Z-Y, who, who we had named after a character in the Muppets, like Fozzy Osborne, I never in my mind had ever processed it as this was gonna be anything more than dudes getting together and having a great time. Isn't that funny how that works? Because you spend so much effort in six speed, like this is our vehicle, you know, we're gonna yeah. make it. And this is just a fun little project that blew up. Yeah. That's amazing how that works. And my mom put it really, my mom is a Jedi master and she told me one time, she was like, you remember how, because I, I, was, I was venting about expectations in the industry and about how, you know, you think, I want this to work and this is the way things should be. You know, we all kind of in our mind, we're blueprint mapping out how we see things and how things should be. And I just told her, I was like, you know, I'm frustrated. My mom said, hey, uh, you remember when I told you that if you put 100% of all of your efforts and you stayed 100% committed and you were, uh, you were unrelenting and you were just vicious in your energy that you would get what you deserved? I was like, yeah. She's like, maybe you just got what you deserved. I was like, hmm. I'm gonna go ponder with some Yoda <laughs> shit on that because it was super right. It's like maybe sometimes things are just not where God or the universe, whatever you, whatever you think the structure is of all of this, um, maybe there are just ceilings. You know, there's no reason. There's no reason why. Uh, you know, some bands make it and certain actors make it and certain one, other ones don't, except for maybe that's just what it's supposed to happen. It, you know, but we, we, in our arrogance, we just think we're so smart, right? We get it all figured out. And my mom just said, you know, maybe this is just the way things are supposed to go. So anytime something happens in the music industry, I just take it as face value. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, I can't believe that I'm getting paid to play with, uh, in a band with a wrestler who, hands down, one of the greatest entertainers, but he's where, but, but we have fake names. You know what I mean? Like, I just can't process it. And it actually made me a little mad at the time because I was thinking, wow, I'm, my, my success in Fozzy was starting to approach my success level in Stuck Mojo, which I lived, breathed. We rehearsed six nights a week when we were on tour. Fozzie doesn't rehearse. Like I said, we were a part-time fun band. Like if, let's say, you and I and Nathan decided to put a band together and go play ZZ Top covers at a local chicken wing joint, we said, well, we should rehearse the night before the show just to yeah. make sure it's not a complete bloodbath. <laughs> that was Fozzie. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. let's run through and that it. that was getting bigger and stuck mojo. So yes! Weird. Yeah. It was very strange, but it just goes to show you. It's like, we don't know. So, uh, on this record, I spent... Uh, I love this record too, by the way. It's thank you. Favorite thank you. Album. I love this record too. Um, I spent six months writing it. Uh, it was a very hard record to make. How'd you get with Zach on there? Zach Wilde played uh, I want to say, I I say that was a Jericho thing. Um, I think so. We, we hired Rick Beato to produce it, and Rick's done some, some big records, and he, he, he's an amazing musician. Uh, but unfortunately, Rick's father got sick with cancer and was dying during the making of this album. So in order for us to make the album, I had to pick up and record all the guitars myself and, and basically mix the album myself. Now I had an, an iMac. Do you remember the old iMacs that were like a blue bubble that looked just like a screen that had the processing power of less than your phone now? <laughs> um, and I had a, a, a thing called an M-Box, which was basically the first um, Pro Tools crappy uh, interface, which the converters and mic pre's in it were the worst of all time. <laughs> And I recorded all the guitars in our rehearsal space. Like I didn't know what I was doing. I, I had just kind of learned Pro Tools, so I really didn't know. And I made a. Re I had to basically make the record a lot on my own. Now, now Beato, Rick did all the drums and all the vocals, but almost everything else um, I had to do myself. Wow. And it was difficult, but it was the best learning process that I had. I don't. I'm not crazy about the way the album sounds, um, but that was my fault because I because in the mixing, I just, I was doing the best I could. Um, and, uh, but 
uh, from that point, it gave me the confidence that I can now be a producer. And, and then from that point on, I became, you know, the, you know, the one thing that was crazy about this album was, is that uh, the reason it's so proggy and there's so many crazy solos and there's so many um, interesting musical bits and pieces in it is, is because we needed to prove that we weren't just a shitty cover band okay. with a wrestler. <laughs> and that's why I was like, well, we have to make something just crazy, right? I mean, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of musician stuff because they, those musicians are going to be the hardest sell, right? Um, you know, the average wrestling fan is going to be like, it's Chris Jericho, it doesn't even matter. Uh, and our, our fan base was, to start with, wrestling fans and Stuck Mojo fans. And after the Stuck Mojo fans saw us the first couple of times, it started to becoming mainly just wrestling fans because Fozzy was not the band that Stuck Mojo fans wanted to see. It wasn't, you know, we were playing, you know, except covers, Crocus covers with wigs. It's like, it wasn't their thing. Yeah. So we were mainly a band who had our demo was wrestling. And if we were going to ever broaden beyond wrestling fans, we were going to have to bring in some, some a new audience. And the one that I knew the best was the musician fan base and they were loyal you know what I mean they they actually buy CDs you know what I mean because people who love music who who are passionate about buying guitars and drum kits and you know people who like that they they, they have a tendency to be a little bit more uh, passionate about supporting each other and so that's why this record when you listen to it you're like wow that, there's, there's some chops on that record and I remember Frank. Marty Freeman's on too. I, didn't I know, know Marty Freeman and Mark Tremonti, yeah. Miles Kennedy. I didn't know they were on there. Yeah. That's crazy. Yes, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, Miles Kennedy sings the chorus in Nameless Faceless. Like, oh, that's yeah. so cool. I know. And it was, and we just wanted to make that record. Like, we, we have to prove ourselves. And how are we going to prove ourselves? Well, first of all, let's get our friends who are these A-lister musicians and get them do some guest performances. And when Marty Friedman plays on your album and Miles Kennedy sings on it, it it's almost, it, it, it is the illusion of them putting a stamp of approval, right? Yeah. Because if they're gonna be on it, they must say, hey, they're digging it. So that was, and then I, I remember I played the first demos. I programmed all the drums on a drum machine and I remember I played the, the demos for Frank and he was like, how am I supposed to play that? It was like there was so much technical odd time stuff and it was just, there was so much of that stuff, but he did great. Yeah, but it was yeah. like, it was a big, it was a big change for us. Um, yeah, and it was, it, was, it was great. So you did the solo record next, right? Yes. Like in this order, right? Yes. I love this thing. What made you decide to do a solo album and make it so different from anything you've previously done? Well, remember I told you earlier that Spitfire had offered me money for Six Speed? Well, the, the industry had kind of recovered by 2004. So I went to Spitfire and had this idea of doing a solo record because I, I, um, I, I, I'm married now uh, to my second wife. Uh, my first wife uh, was a nice lady. There's just, we just got married after meeting each other for a few weeks. It was one of those things like, yo, I love you. We should get married. Vegas. Yeah, yeah, way to go, let's do this. <laughs> The greatest thing about it was is that the the three years that we were together were the most amazing because uh, I lived most of my life on the road from uh, 1989 until 2000. I was on the road with Stuck Mojo. Almost, I had a girlfriend, but I saw her you know 30 days a year. Like I had I had no relationship skills. Then I got married and I had a crash course because we weren't touring. Remember, there's no Stuck Mojo touring between 2000 and 2003, which is when I was married. Fozzie's not touring. We play 20 shows a year, and Cafu Six Speed was playing. I don't know, uh, three shows a month. Didn't you start like cutting grass for a living or something? Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah man. I'm like that's crazy. What am I gonna do? Yeah, you know, like it's stressful. Yeah. I mean, we signed, deal, our, our, our deal with Century Media was pretty much the standard deal that most independent metal bands sign, which is you sign your publishing away. So I had no publishing checks. There's no money coming in from Stuck Mojo. So, because, now I could always do what a lot of those other bands did and re-record those songs, you know, uh, like yeah, do the, and yeah, 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 you could, and, and try to make some cash off that, but I didn't have the equity in the, in the bank to go and re-record. Mm -hmm. So, I was flat broke. I sold uh, my two main Les Pauls that I had. I sold my Explore. 
I was, I was going, starting to sell things like prized possessions because I didn't have any money. And I was driving a, I don't remember what year it was, maybe a 94 Nissan truck with like an aftermarket camper shell on, shell on the back of it looked freaking brutal. Were you thinking about like how much money you spent on catering when you're out there on a lawnmower going, damn, I shouldn't spend all that money on catering. Well, like I, <laughs> that, but that's the problem with most bands is like, yeah. like with Stuck Mojo, I knew everything. Mm. Like my manager, Mark Willis and I, control. there was, I, I wasn't in control, we were a band. Like, but Bones and I knew everything that was happening. We, there was communication. In Fozzy, we were signed to a record company and it wasn't my priority. So when, and I'm talking about in 2000 when we spent whatever, 10,000 bucks on catering and $30,000 on a photo shoot, like, I didn't know I showed up for a photo shoot. I said, what's all that? Like, you know, like, like I, in other words, like if it had been stuck mojo, I'd have known what the budgets were, like yeah. because I would have discussed it, right? But with Fozzie, it was kind of like, um, it was out of sight, out of mind because it wasn't my passion at that moment. You know, it was just kind of this like, oh, side gig, we're gonna do a photo shoot, cool. <laughs> like I remember the main thing I was worried about is making sure like I, I had lost a little bit of weight. I was super ripped up for the like, yeah, I would get in there. And, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, you, you know, my 29 year old brain, I'm thinking about all the superficial stuff. I never asked how much are we spending? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, but I was, I've never lived beyond my means. I've never bought cars. I, uh, I've never bought houses or ha I, the only thing I ever bought that was kind of, you know, that was my kind of addiction was I bought a lot of Marshall lamps. I bought a lot of Gibson Les Pauls and, but I knew how to buy them cheap. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, you know, remember when, when everybody started playing Ibanez's and Jackson's and stuff in like the eighties and, uh, nineties and into the early two thousands, you could get a vintage Les Paul for 600 bucks. Nobody wanted one. It's like, yeah. fine, yeah. And like, I just was going to pawn shops, was buying, going to use music that stores. Sounds like a reality show, Leo. I know. I wish I. I, some stuff, yeah, I was stuff. buying Marshall heads for four hundred bucks a, a piece. Or, you know, older at JCM eight hundreds, where the, it's the amps that everybody used, but nobody wanted them because everybody wanted the newest, latest thing. It was this was all about, you know, the and and so luckily for me, when I was going through this terrible financial hardship in two thousand four and five. I had so much gear to sell. I was like, well, you know, it's like stocks and bonds. You know what I mean? Like I had, I had tangible assets, you know? So I was able to sell stuff. And then one summer, I, okay, so uh, the story. So this album, I, uh, most of this album is all about my, uh, my, relationship with my first wife and also with there is a little bit of stuff in there about some band member stuff just relationship stuff this is all just it used to be sounds definitely relationship oh right? I love god this me too dude it's i love all. this record it's like it's weird i actually did listen to one? this i mean you go we went to one? europe once and we did some stuff in the states but and i'll get to why so super passionate the record company spitfire super passionate every like Oh my God, this, I could have a solo career. This is amazing. Um, you know, uh, things were going great. And then Spitfire Records sold to Universal. Um, so Alice Cooper, um, Zach Wilde, for Black Label, um, Sebastian Bach, all of those bands that were on Spitfire, whoosh, we all got shelved. And I was the new dude on the block because my record only been out for three months. Mm. So I'd, I'd gone to Europe, uh, we did well. Um, and, but the long story short was we didn't have a record deal now. And so it was like, uh, okay. So now I've been dropped, uh, by, uh, but they owned the album, Universal owned the album. So I couldn't re-release it for 10 years. So, okay. So I can't go tour with that. Uh, I tried a reunion show with, uh, Bones in 2005, which is around the same time. It wasn't great. Uh, Jericho's had twin daughters who were born three months premature and it was oh, very yeah. scary. Mm. Um, and I, this was in April, I think of 2005 and I had no money and I had no bands. And so I went and worked for a friend of mine mowing grass for the summer. Yeah, it's humbling. Isn't it? <laughs> it's just no survival, survival right? Survival, yeah. Yeah. You know, like, you know, a lot of, I would do it again today if I had to. Mm -hmm. You know, I, nobody nobody wants to work in Georgia, you know, in a landscaping crew, but a lot of people who do it. Mm 
some of them are probably better guitar players than me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's just, hey, I had to. And, it, and the thing is, is that it was a great catalyst for me to remember that nothing is permanent and none of this is guaranteed. And uh, which has always been my motto, Jericho's great, uh, the quick sidebar, Jericho is great because he, anytime something's happening, like there's a chart position movement for a single or if something's great or a big tour, he always sends me a text. It's like, dude, yes. And he's super excited. He always, he has this amazing uh, youthful uh, excitement about everything. And I'm always like, mm. not that I'm not appreciative. I like, I love touring and I love that, but, I've had so many of those, yeah, oh, yeah, fuck, yeah, sure. Like, like I, I've had so much of that that I no longer yell on the way up. You know what I mean? Like, I never do because it always just sets me up for whatever that is. Yeah. Like, and I've just learned that, you know, some people just take mood altering drugs to deal with that stuff or they, whatever. Now I just, I just don't keep your hopes I, up. Yeah. Well, I just don't pop for the good stuff anymore. Yeah. I'm like, way to go. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Like I get a check in for, uh, you know, writer's royalty for something for a, ooh, whoo, like, but it's a very short thing. It's not a spike into the football. It's just dropped a knee. Thank God. Yeah. You're like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. but I don't want to text everybody. <laughs> like, you know, you're like, dude, you're never going to believe you're like now. And the crazy thing is I know we're going, but the crazy thing is, is I'm currently making more money than I ever have in my life. Uh, and it's just weird. I don't know why. It's like, I don't, I, you know, I'm not supposed to. I'm 49. Like, I'm not, like, and it, it ain't Molly Crew money. I'll keep going back to that. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it is in Rich Ward world. I still drive a, a very, a very used car. And I still live in a very small, modest house which is why the money I'm making now, it makes me happy because, um, uh, because I've always lived within my means and I've never, you know, if I had a $500 car payment and $150 insurance payment and a, you know, $3,000 house payment, what I'm making now wouldn't cover that. You're like, I'm not making, I'm making good money for my life. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's, the thing is, is that it's all relative, right? It's like, I, I've stopped a long time ago looking into other bands' pockets because everybody I know, all my friends in every band I know is broke, like varying degrees. And I mean, people that we've already talked about broke, mm. like to the point of like saying no money, like they have to, they have to tour divorces, child support, been s robbed by a manager or a, an agent, record company defaulted, uh, bankrupted on them. I don't really know a lot of people in my world that have a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, obviously Zach Wilde and there are guys, Rob Zombies and the guys in Corn, and there are bands making money. And then there's everybody else. Mm -hmm. There, Then there is that kind of middle class guys who you assume are making big money and they're not, they're making get by money. And then there's the young bands who are making no money. And that's the thing is, is that, um, and, and I'm, I'm lucky in that uh, I, I realized that this could end and the next record could, could not be this successful. And so I'm not gonna buy a car and I'm not gonna, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not, like, it's like an athlete, you know what I mean? I had a good year, yeah, you know what I mean? It's like, but I'm also a 49 year old guy who wants to make a lot more of these, you know what I mean? And it may mean for me to make the next one of these that I have to take some of this money and invest in it. Mm -hmm. Because, not because I think I'm gonna make any money, because I love doing this, which is what I did on this album yeah, right here. Too, yeah. Okay, so I paid for this album. This album ruined me. I spent a fortune on that album, I came out of pocket a, a lot of money. As a matter of fact, this album first, I started writing with Bones and we recorded it twice. Uh, we recorded it once with Bones and then once with Lord Nelson. Yeah, I remember hearing a song, Home, I think, or originally Bones. I remember some kind of something. I think it was there. I'm Back. Was yes, one, I'm yes, Back. Yeah. That's it, I'm sorry. Yep, which later became um, I'm American, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. But uh, we tried it and just Bones was in a, in a, in a rough spot. And it just, I was in a, I was in that 
I was in the spot we just talked about. Remember, everything I just said about pushing a lawnmower and having no money and all that stuff, like I was coming out of that period of time and uh, I, I, I had gotten kind of back on my feet and I, I remember we did some Fozzy gigs that I made a little bit of money. So I got a credit card and I uh, financed this album on, on cash on hand. Uh, and my wife, who I married in 2005, I married my wife in May of 2005 and was pushing a lawnmower in June. Like, can you imagine she never said a word. Uh, I'm super fortunate. I have, yeah, I, have I have an amazing relationship. My wife never said anything other than, "Man, I'm I'm proud of you." Uh, you know, she worked. We both worked. You know, like we don't have kids at that. You know, so it was just like, "Hey, we both worked a job. Um, we were living in an apartment. Do what we had to do." Man, yeah, she's so, a keeper, right? Yeah, praise Jesus. Yeah, so. I wanted to do another Stuck Mojo record. I had been writing stuff and my goal was to do a record with, with Bones. Once I realized that wasn't, uh, was it the, it just wasn't gonna happen. I had met Lord Nelson through Bones because we brought Lord Nelson in to do guest vocals for this, for this original version, this record. And I, I was like, oh my God, this guy's voice. Oh God, he's so, and he's a 300 pound guy six foot five or six foot six and he was a beast i was just like oh my god he's like you know he looks like a lineman yeah. you know and he and he his he was his his flow was very musical now bones is um not what i would consider a rapper i would consider bones a vocalist in the same way that i'd consider henry rollins a vocalist like bones is bones he doesn't sound like anybody when he's like he has his own thing which is a again it is a, that is super unique and something that's super special in this business. Anytime someone goes, Ozzy's not a great singer. It's like, really? Because when he sings three notes, you know who it is immediately. Yeah. Like he, same with Bones. Same he has like, Bones. he has a thumbprint. As soon as he starts like, oh, that's him. But Bones wasn't technically, uh, his flow wasn't like a quote unquote rapper guy. Lord Nelson was, which I found fresh because anytime that you're gonna, if you're going to make a change, uh, you know, you don't wanna get the guy who sounds like the last guy. You know what I mean? Or you don't wanna get the guy, hey look, this guy looks, it's, this, it's, the, it's the blindfold taste test, you know, like if you don't, you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't want the guy that kind of looks a little bit like him and sounds, my goal was if I'm, go if we're, if I'm gonna make a record with another guy, it's got to be something different. It has to be. It has to be Sammy Hagar, David Lee Roth. It can't be. You know what I mean? It has yeah. to be like really making a, a change. Right. Otherwise, it would. It would. It would be bad. So he's a good changer. He's good. God, he's yeah. so good. I had, we had so much fun making this record, and it was the first time I'd actually collaborated in a room with a guy. Like Jericho and I don't collaborate in a room together. No, he writes lyrics and sends them to me. And then like, kind of like the Elton John, Bernie Taupin relationship. Yeah. Bernie Taupin sends Elton John lyrics. And that's what I do with Jericho's lyrics. I write songs with his lyrics. That's or I write songs and then take his lyrics and try to see which ones kind of work together. <laughs> yeah, right whereas with Bones, Bones I would write demos and Bones would rap and write to the demos. Lord Nelson and I sat in a room together. It was so cool. I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. How about if we did, like, the first time I've ever had anything improvised, there's a song called Open Season on this album, and the bridge section is a one-take improvisation. I was like, oh my God. Like, it's the first time I've worked with somebody who was really, uh, like, I'm not the kind of guitar player who can sit in a room and go, if a producer goes, okay, I just want you to improvise some stuff. We're gonna do one take, let's go. I was like, can I have 10 minutes with it just to kind of work some stuff out? Like, I like to write, you know what I mean? Like, come up, can I just work with it? Like, this guy, he could do those kind of like battle things where like a DJ just plays something, he could just start going. Oh, he's yeah. so talented. Oh God, he's, he's breathtaking. He's like guitar player like Steve Lukather from Toto. Like he could go sit in with any band and hurt your feelings. Like he's just <laughs> like, oh stop. Like, so it was really fun making this record and I'm super, actually this is my, the album that I listened to the most of the older material. Uh, 
you know, I love Pig Walk, I love Rising, and I love Declaration, but I probably listen to this record the most. And the reason is it's the perfect balance for me of the rap vocals and the melodic stuff, because I'm still a melody kid. I mean, you and I hung out at Striper. Yeah. I love melody. You know, like if when I listen to Pig Walk, there's not tons of melody on that record. It's a super aggressive album, and I love it, and I'm glad that we made it, but it really feels like the angry young Rich Ward. This this record is definitely kind of the amalgamation of all my influences. It's all the things I like about rock. Mm -hmm. It's big riffs, super aggressive, and, and dude, this album was a big success for me too. I was doing interviews on Fox News because of this album. Really? Yeah, we had, Bar uh, uh, what was her name? Oh God, I'm embarrassed. Actually, I'm, I'm not embarrassed. Um, it was, um, uh, I don't, I, don't rem I don't think it was Barbara Boxer. It was, it was one of the senators of California. There was two senators from, uh, female senators from California. One that declared us a hate band because we've, uh, we've declared a war against uh, Islam. It's like, that's not what the song's about at all. But uh, I was like, oh my God, we were like actually, like this video had almost a million views after two or three months. Like I had all these people in Afghanistan and Iraq sending me, you know, this is during the height of the Iraq war, sending me videos of them, you know, listening to the song and training and pictures. Like I was like, that's oh my, that's was, insane. I know it was like the, the next chapter of my life that like, like I did something with a group of people that actually resonated with people. And that was like, that meant a lot to me because, you know, we're basically chefs, right? Mm -hmm. You make content, you're a chef. I make content, I'm a chef, right? We're cooking. And you're hoping that, you're, that your interviews and that your online content resonates with people and that they wanna keep watching you, not just because you're interviewing Michael Sweet or Clint or me, um, you're hoping that they come back because they like you, because they like your style and they like your presentation. They, you're hoping that you're building your brand and you're hoping that it resonates and that whatever you're doing as a chef you're cooking to some pallets and then people are like, wow, that's really good. All of a sudden there were a lot of people eating at my restaurant right. and really enjoying. And you got a, a new singer, so you're taking a chance saying, I hope my fans follow what we're doing, you know? And the, it's a risk and it, you got rewarded. Yeah, so. and the thing was is that we had a whole brand new audience because you have to think, I think this came out in 2006. This was, you know, I mean, six years is a long time if you just think about six years ago, what you were doing and what I was doing is like, that was a long time ago. And then you think about back to, um, you know, Snap and Necks, which was 11 years before this. I mean, a lot of our fans grew up, you know, they had kids, they're, they're not going to concerts anymore. This was reaching a different audience. And I was lucky that a lot of people, I mean, when I went to Europe and toured this album, yeah. th there were, mainly folks that were new Stuck Mojo fans. So when I, when I came back and he wasn't there, people were like, where's Lord Nelson? You know what I mean? It's like, it's funny how people are. It's like, they weren't pissed about Bones, they were pissed about Lord Nelson. And it just goes to show you generationally, like, you know, people today going to see Kiss concerts, they're not so bent out of shape about Ace Frehley because they didn't grow up with Ace Frehley. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're like, hey, I love Animalize. I love Bruce Kulick. Like people, like depends on what you came up with. That reminds me so much of like Van Halen because I'm a Sammy guy because he was, I was that age, you know, when, when he came out, you know. And I went through both, right? Because I like both too, but I was, I was, you know, young, young before Sammy. So Yeah. And, and to me, I listen to more Sammy material than I do Dave stuff. I Everything. love I love that Sammy stuff. It's really good. I mean, and because it cooks for my palate. Is it better than the Dave stuff? It doesn't matter. What is better? It doesn't matter. You know, like people are like, what's better, Godfather one or two? I don't know. Which one do you like better? <laughs> like, does it? You know what I mean? It's yeah. like this whole thing of going to Rotten Tomatoes and seeing an aggregate of what people like, or somebody you know does an album review of of this album, by the way, which got hugely good reviews. Um, it's just one guy doing a review, mm -hmm. right? It's like it's yeah. not like he's speaking for That's his the, opinion. Yeah, yeah. And, and and then we did this album, which got a one out of ten 
review on Blabbermouth on their album reviews. <laughs> like, I was like, the Duke is numero uno. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because he hated it. And that's the guy you know, right? The guy running Blabbermouth? He ran it, but he didn't do the review. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He, and he actually, he actually sent me an email, Bory did. Oh, and he, did he? Yeah, and he said, he said, dude, he said, I gotta kind of apologize to you. Uh, he's like, I didn't think the record was that bad. Uh, you know, it wasn't my favorite Stuck Mojo record, but I didn't think it was a one out of 10. But he's, he, he doesn't do his album reviews. He pays a guy to do reviews yeah. for his website. That's the way it works. Yeah. So I was like, dude, <laughs> I'd rather get a one than a five. Do you know what I mean? It's like, don't give me a five. It yeah. means ah, I was all right. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I freaking hate it. It's the worst <laughs> thing ever. It's like, I'll take hate or love. I, it's, it's when people start going, ah, that's all right. You know, that's, that's when I get nervous. So you went back after that, you went, you did Chasing the Grail, right? So Yes. You can talk about this. This album's hard to find. Yeah, you know, I talked to Jericho It's, it's out of print. It. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because the license on it, uh, the record company had a 10-year license. The license has reverted back to us, so we own the album. And we've chosen not to put it out on, uh, on iTunes and license it ourselves for right now, because the idea is, is that maybe it can be a leverage chip in the future towards um, bonus material, like a, a compilation thing. You know what I mean? Like a live record that this is, a or, I don't know. You don't know. It's oh, like it's cool. for us just to throw it out there to get it up on iTunes doesn't make any sense. There's no, other than it's available for streaming. If you want, you can go on YouTube and stream it. It's, it's there if you, if you want it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just not officially out there. So I think we just need to have a great reason to put is it out. Is that hard when you go in the studio and put all blood, sweat, and tears in an album that doesn't get pushed like that doesn't get released nah, it, I don't care anymore you don't care mm -hmm. nah doesn't bother me because um, uh, did you ever uh, you know Rocky 4 yeah I fight for I me yeah. yeah I fight for me like I make records for me and, and uh, I, I really do I mean I'm not I'm not saying that because the the the, the paycheck's always the same like I've never I've never really experienced the um, uh, the the uh, the payoff of man if we just did a little bit maybe if we you know maybe if I cut my hair and like wore like a button down shirt you know what I mean and try and wore eyeliner and like tried to be a little more modern looking maybe you know maybe that would sell I, like I'm not even willing to roll those dice I am who I am I'm an old man by industry standards I mean the the industry has changed obviously I mean now I mean there's a lot of it, but if you're talking about like the, the bands in the top 40 charts, it's a young person's game. The, the major labels, I mean, there's still a huge market in the indie metal world for bands like us. I mean, there is. I mean, we sell a lot of records. We make a lot of money for Century Media, which is good. But um, in the big scheme of things, all of those Black Veil Brides and the um, kind of the and I know they've been around for a while, but you know what I mean? The Asking Alexandria is like that kind of younger bullet for my Valentine, the guys who were in their early 30s. When they got signed, they were in their early 20s, just like we were, mm -hmm. you know? Like it's a young person's game and you're lucky if you can put down strong enough roots that as you start to gracefully age, that you're working hard enough to earn your fan base. I will say this, I go see uh, Asking Alexandria or Blackfield Brides or Bullet For My Valentine who are all badass bands. I love them. Uh, but, I, you know, I mean, they're still not putting out more energy than I do live. I mean, they, they don't. They don't. And the reason is, is because I get up in the morning and I train hard and it's, it's, I love exercising, but it's because it's part of my job. Mm -hmm. My job is, is that when you look at Mick Jagger, who's 74, and you go and watch a live video of him, he's still out he's crushing everybody yeah. he still r sprints down the catwalk yeah. he's sprinting down the catwalk <laughs> and i'm like and that's and i saw john fogarty last week how was that amazing john fogarty absolutely crushed it and he, he's a 73 year old man he was running around like with a 12 pound vintage les paul and he was running not not walking fast running and that was because he loves music and he wants to put on a good show. And then ZZ Top, who's one of my favorite bands on the entire planet, came out and played a sleepy show. 
Oh, did they? Yeah. Well, because John Fogarty just ran around. You know, it, yeah. It's like he just ran around and then ZZ Top came out there and did what ZZ Top did. But I always want to be the Fogarty. All right. So your next Fozzie record is uh, Sin and Bones. Can you talk a little bit about this record? I actually really like this album. I think it's uh, one of the best sounding Fozzie records. It's a collaboration. Like, after, uh, I uh, guess, All the Remains, I became Fozzie's producer. So, uh, but I was always hiring Sean Grove, uh, an engineer, to come in and kind of uh, drive the car, so to speak. So he would be the guy on the console where we were recording drums, uh, and he would help me with the mix. So, uh, you know, we, we didn't have huge budgets, so the majority of the budget of recording a record is you go into the big studio with the huge cutting room that's you know fifteen hundred dollars a day you're paying your engineer who's 500 bucks plus a day and then on top of that his uh expenses flights accommodations so then you're about 2250 in a day just to track drums so you're like oh my god you start looking at your your budget and you're like Oh my God, we're gonna eat through the entire budget just on, we gotta get these drums in the can. So you start to start thinking, how many days do we do? So this was the, one of the first records that we were really pre prepared. I had everyone, I had all the demos early. I'd work with Jericho, we had done some demos vocally. He knew everything and I started using vocal guides. Um, any singer, uh, and I, I got this idea from hearing about it from U2. Uh, Guitars are very hard to pitch to. Mm -hmm. uh, distorted guitars are, as a singer. But piano is a very easy instrument to pitch to. So when U2 plays, they have a keyboard player under the stage who plays piano chords. It's easier for, oh, yeah, for him to pitch to. Uh, a lot of uh, singers in the studio, I did not know this, but do piano guides because it helps you lock into uh, the key easier. Mm -hmm. So I, all the melody on this record, I played on piano. So I played the whole... Do you still have that? Uh, yeah, That'd be cool. I do. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So it's basically like Muzak. It's, it's <laughs> this album, but with Piano Guy. Do you play piano? I didn't even know you did I'm that. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good enough to like write with. I wouldn't want to be the guy. I mean, I played all the piano on Declaration of a Headhunter, mm -hmm. but that was just kind of easy stuff. I'm not, I, mm -hmm. I would, I always get Terry Chisholm plays all the keys on our stuff because he's a real keyboard player. Mm -hmm. um, but I just played Piano Guide and it was amazing how good Jericho was because for the first time he could really hear the melody defined. You know, like, like everything is there and it's rhythmically there. Yeah. So, uh, so he could stop like, because the, the hardest thing for a singer is, is to do things right. Mm -hmm. Right means pitch, timing, tone. Okay. Those are like the, the big three components for a singer, pitch, timing, and tone. Now remember, if you're concentrating on pitch, timing, and tone, you're probably doing a terrible job of connecting with the lyrics because you're too worried about the technical side, right? So you're all worried about all of the technical stuff and then all of a sudden no one cares about your vocal performance because it doesn't emote. Mm -hmm. So the easiest way to get a singer to emote is to make a singer super comfortable with the song where he really feels comfortable and technically not having to worry about the technical side. And the piano guide allows Chris to have basically the bumper bowling up on him to really help him hear the melody while he's singing. On Chasing the Grail, I sang the album and then he had me as a guide oh, on cool. some of the songs. Yeah. But it's distracting hearing someone else singing. Oh. You know what I mean? It's yeah. super distracting. Like, can you imagine you're singing, trying to do a duet with someone? It's freaking brutal. <laughs> you know, it's terrible. Um, but. Once we move to piano guides, that's why I think Jericho uh, on, I, th I th really feel like uh, on Sin and Bones, it's one of Chris's first times where I'm like, boom, mm -hmm. like huge jump in his, uh, not just technically, but his performances were getting better. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a big part of it. And I also think this record, I think Sin and Bones is a great balance between 
good melodic stuff, but it's still super aggressive. It's got some really good riffing on it. The drumming still feels like a metal record. Yeah. So it's that balance, like Chasing the Grail was a metal record. This album, Sin and Bones, is, is a better marriage of what I love about melodic metal. It yeah. still has really cool, catchy, big choruses, but, it's, but it still has all the riffing in there. Right, I, I, I was telling you earlier, but I love that Sandpaper song, and you're talking about the melodies, that sounds great. And yeah. you had, uh, who was on that song? M Shadows, M -Shadows. Yeah, yeah, from uh, Avenged Sevenfold, one of the, I think, I think Avenged Sevenfold is the biggest metal band that's not a legacy band, right? I mean, if you think about all of the bands that are out there of, call it the, the newer genre, not, not Metallica, not, not You're Guns. You're talking about like Five Finger, Death Punch, this kind of. Correct, I, of all the more modern stuff, I right. think Avenged is the biggest, yeah, and, definitely. and Jericho's friends with Matt. So he just said, hey, would you like to sing on our record? And he's like, sure. I was, I was waiting for him to pop in the video. <laughs> he's there is he yes oh my so, gosh okay so what so here's what you'll know so watch the sandpaper video and because we couldn't get uh matt at our video shoot what we did is he went to a video he went to a studio in la and filmed all his parts and there's a old vintage tv in the cabin that we filmed the sandpaper video and we projected his image onto the TV screen. Oh man, I missed yeah, that. Yeah. I, mean, I gotta revisit that. Yeah, it's it's uh, <laughs> it's Evil Dead uh, meets Matt. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So your next album, Do You Want to Start a War? This was huge. Um, can you talk about this? This first song, Do You Want to Start a War? It sounded so different from what I was used to. Yeah, this, this record, uh, I think the evolution to this record was, was na I mean, Fozzie, Stuck Mojo was much more of a, um, a no rules, let's just, we're going to, we're just going to do whatever we want. Fozzie, we were kind of evolving as a band and it was much more organic than it was the young dudes in Stuck Mojo. Because when you're in your 20s, you're still you're still exploring, you know, you're like you're, you're literally astronauts, right? Yeah. But the guys making this record are in their 40s. So we know who we are as musicians. This super fine tuned, we're so dialed in. I, I know who I am. I'm not trying to play like anybody else at this point. So the idea is uh, to try to continue to evolve as a band and make better records. The idea is as a songwriter, I was trying to um, write more effectively for Chris. So we had really had some great success with Chris's vocals on, on Sin and Bones. And then uh, as a learning experience, I was getting better and better. Because remember, I, I recorded all of Chris's vocals on Chasing the Grail. I recorded all of Chris's vocals and produced all of his vocals on Sin and Bones. So I've got two albums under my belt of sitting in a room with him and a microphone. And I don't go behind the glass. We sit in a room together, mm. headphones on, so we can talk. You know, like, man, it was really good. And, and when you're singing, the producer is just a coach. All he's doing is just like you would if you're a football coach or a baseball coach, you're watching the guy swing. Yeah. You know, and you're just saying, okay, and you're, you're, you're telling this athlete how he can make some minor adjustments to be a better version of him. Mm -hmm. And that's all I want. I don't want Chris to be a different singer. I just want him to be the best version of Jericho he can. And Chris, he has one of the most gifted voices I've ever heard. And, and the reason is, is that you take a guy like, um, you know, some of these guys from the 80s who had these amazing voices, but their voices were like Ferraris and that you drove them hard for three years and they don't work anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. they literally, he, Jericho is like, Dio or one of these guys. So he doesn't have to like tune down. Is that like I'm not No, he that. can do whatever he wants. His, awesome. his, he could stay up all night long and drink. And the next day I'm like, I don't understand how you can sing. Like it's physiologically, you're not supposed to be able to, yeah. you know, but he, he literally, he, he's like a, you know, a, a big dually pickup truck. <laughs> he will just crush through the, the barrier of physics vocally. And he's just great. And, uh, and he never really has a night where his voice isn't working. But the, the trick is to write melodies for him with Chris's lyrics that's, that pitch to his strike zone. Where is he 
had his strongest. Where is his, like, and stay away from areas where, because Chris is not a bluesy singer. He's not Paul Rogers, he's not David Coverdale. That's not his thing. He is a rock singer. He's much more um, of a standard metal guy. So you stay away from the bluesy melodies and that kind of bluesy rock stuff. And, 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 and honestly, you could write more pop stuff for him. Yeah. He, he, he could be a pop singer if he wanted to because he, his voice works well in that kind of confines. And he has, he has enough of that Axl Rose scratchiness in his voice that it just sits great in the track. So it's a, again, it's finding those moments and on, do you want to start a war? Um, I was just in, I was like inspired to write some groovier stuff. So like the opening riff for do you want to start a war could be the riff on a Stuck Mojo record. Mm -hmm. It's like, it has, it could have been on Declaration of a Headhunter, but I added some dancey elements rhythmically and the drums so that it, it has its own kind of, you know, Chris is big into pop music too and big into metal. So it's a matter of, yeah, it's cooking soup, right? Right. Yeah, and I know who I'm cooking for now. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool how you work with them coaching around. That's really awesome. You have to. Like, yeah, because as musicians, we don't know, we don't always know where our strengths are. Sometimes it just takes those people who have been working with you for years and can just break down, uh, you know, the mechanics of how you're singing, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and Chris, trust me, we're partners. You know, That's we've been great. together almost 20 years. So kind of coming off this high, you, you got Mojo back and um, you got a new singer. I'm my mind. Robbie J. Robbie J, yes. Yeah. So, so just like, uh, just like on Southern Born Killers, this was supposed to be a reunion record. Mm -hmm. We did a reunion show at Masquerade. Was there. Yep. Show. Yeah. That's right. I, I, we talked. That's yes. right. Yes. Yeah. Um, the idea was Bones, uh, myself, Frank, and Corey were going to do uh, a few shows and then make a record. Mm -hmm. uh, the first show I thought was amazing. I, I mean, I literally thought, oh my oh, God. Oh, man, that was It was crazy. such a great gig. Yeah, yeah. It was so good. And then the second gig. South was, Carolina or something? Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah, Charlotte. Okay. was okay. And then the third show I thought was was good was good but it wasn't it definitely and then uh Corey got a call to go do what became the Santa Sonia band yeah and I just looked at Frank and was like okay because Corey had filled in for us on a Fozzie tour because our bass player Paul DeLeo has another gig as well with this pop Holy star Joel? Nina. Oh, okay, Nina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the 99 Red Balloons girl. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, so he has that gig, uh, who she's still an arena band in Europe. Mm -hmm. So occasionally there's some conflicting dates. She plays arena, so they book tours months, months, she's months huge out. Over there. Huge. She's a coach <laughs> on The Voice in Germany. Oh, wow. Yeah, huge, huge artist. So I asked Corey, I said, hey, could you fill in for us? Uh, and this was right after the reunion show. And when we got, and we were so excited about making another Stuck Mojo record, and uh, about kind of rekindling the band, and it was it was time, right? Mm -hmm. Enough time had gone by, and then, you know, we just we just had this talk, and it was the same like the walk we had in you know ten years or twenty years earlier, it was twenty years earlier. It was you know it was like okay, yeah, uh, we just felt like you know, wasn't gonna work again, and he was gonna go do the St. Sonia thing. And I was like, well, I'm not gonna do a reunion record without Corey, and things are already getting kind of weird. And the, the thing that really kind of, uh, that was the real nail in that coffin was, uh, Bones called me one day and said, hey, I'm, I'm moving to Madison, Wisconsin. I was like, when? He's like, uh, tomorrow. What? We're supposed to start writing the new Mojo record. How are we going to write? He's yeah. like, well, just send me demos and I'll work on them there. I was like, all right. My bass player is joining another band. I think he didn't say I don't want to do the Mojo thing, but I'm joining another band. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, and then Bones is moving to Madison. I was like, huh. The thing that sucked was I had like six songs written that I was super in love with. Yeah. Like I was, I was invested. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was like running a marathon. I bought the shoes and I'm training. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, you know, if something happens to the, the streets I'm supposed to run, I'll run someplace my else. My favorite quote you said on my, my friend Joshua Toomey, uh, you said, 
if I'm down by a river or something, I got my pole, fishing ball, I'm gonna fish. That's exactly right. Yeah. I was there, I was committed. Um, and it was the weirdest thing. I, I was probably, I'm, you know, I'm always a little weird on timeline, but it was within a day or two, maybe three at the most, after I had decided that, okay, uh, this is not gonna work. Uh, I, you know, this idea of this reunion record is just dissolved uh, in front of me. So uh, Frank and I were like, oh, well, we have a great band in Fozzie. It's not like it's the end of the earth. You know what I mean? It's like, this was just going to be something in addition to Fozzie, not instead of. It was, there was never the idea of let's put Fozzie in the back burner. It was just like, you know, whatever, you know, like Billy Sheen and the winery dog. He's also got four other bands. Like, yeah. you know, we were just gonna make it work. Chris is still wrestling. We're gonna make this work. Right. Um, and I, I, uh, you know, I I'm, I'm a late night social media guy. So before I go to bed, I do what everybody does. Yeah. And this guy on Twitter sent me a message and said, I think you'll dig my band. You know, I'm a big fan and this and that. I was like, oh. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> right. And I was like, that's, that vocalist is ridiculous. What was his band called before? It was Hasta the, La Murta. I can never remember that. Yeah. That's a hard name for Yeah, me, me too. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it was, they were really cool. They were like, they were like a playful version of Stuck Mojo. Like the goofy party version of Pantera meets Stuck Mojo. Yeah. And I was like, and this guy, he was aggressive, the vocalist, but he also had swagger and he was cool. I was like, man, I, I'm really digging this guy's vibe. Mm -hmm. So I investigated what his name was and I just followed him on Twitter and just sent him a message. But didn't you not want to tell him like originally, didn't you kind of- I say, didn't tell him. Yeah, yeah, okay. I was like, I didn't want anyone to know there was no re reunion album. I was like, I, I, you know, like I literally just said, I, well, cause I didn't know him. You know what I mean? I want him going bragging on Twitter. He could be a jerk. You know what I mean? Like, oh, look at Rich Romy. You know, like, so I just said, hey man, we're making a new Stuck Mojo record. I just saw your video and I'm super into like what you do. Like your voice is so good and your vibe is so good. Um, would you be interested in coming to Atlanta and doing a guest vocal on the album? He's like, dude, I would love to. I was like, I'll fly you down to Atlanta. He, he was living in Montreal, Canada. So I, I flew him to Atlanta and we worked for like two days. And I know he was like, we were in a small, I, I had a rented space, like, a, like at an office park, I put a studio up because I wanted to stop working out of my house just to get some, sometimes when I work in my house, I have dogs, my wife comes home. You know, yeah, like I just exactly. wanted the space away. Absolutely. So I was working in a, in a, a little office park and uh, he was just like, we're not really in a studio and these songs aren't finished. <laughs> like, and I was writing with him and I had some <laughs> lyrics. I was like, hey, just try this. And what about, and, I, and then after the first night, I was like, hey, okay, when you go back to your hotel tonight, I'm gonna drop you off. Can you work on writing some vocals for this bit here? And the next day is like, <laughs> like I, I just said, dude, uh, I just gotta tell you the truth. <laughs> I, I was just kind of auditioning you, yeah. but I didn't want to tell you I was auditioning you. I just wanted to write with you, see how you were. And he was like, I was like, dude, after the second day, I was like, you want to be in the band? He's like, well, what's going on with the band? And I just explained, I was like, just there isn't a band. Mm -hmm. um, and I told him, I was like, I don't know if we'll, how many shows we'll play. I don't know, it's gonna be probably pretty part-time. Uh, it could be, could blow up, I don't know. I said, I don't know, I, the music business is, it's literally like diving with sharks. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Could be beautiful, could get bit, I don't know. You know, and you just gotta have to, if this is something you wanna do, I told him, you won't have to pay for anything. I, t I told him to take care of you. Like, you know, I took care of all his hotels and flights and bought every one of his meals and stuff. I said, but I'm not, I can't pay you. This has to be a thing where we'll be partners. Just like, I didn't want this thing to be like, this guy's a hired guy. Mm -hmm. So when we did Stuck Mojo, it was like, all of us are equal partners. Like, you know, uh, I still get to be the boss so that if I hate your ideas, I get to say no. Yeah, um, you need somebody. But, yeah, you have to have a captain. Yeah. But, but we're all, Everybody's got a paddle in the water. And he, he was so good. I mean, I'm, st I'm still in love with Robbie. And we're gonna do another Mojo record with Robbie because um, 
not only is he super smart, not only is he super talented, but I like making music with him. And, and that's, for me, moving forward, it's gotta be, uh, it's gotta be passionate. Like we're, I'm having a great time talking with you. We were talking about We Love Podcast. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I, I don't wanna do anything else. Uh, in other words, if it's a job, uh, I, actually I was talking to Mark Willis, my manager on the way here, and uh, people from time to time tell me, he's like, dude, just put the word out, go get a big gig, mm -hmm. you know? Go get a gig, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, like I got a gig. And it, like, yeah. and people don't realize, it's like, maybe, maybe we're not headlining arenas and maybe I could get a gig, you know, like bands like Foreigner. I was like, who's that guy? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like right. this, oh, every band's got like a couple guys, so some of those legacy bands, yeah, yeah. like the guy, uh, I met the guy at Striper, you met him too, mm -hmm. who was playing for- Firehouse, uh, right? Yeah, well, no, the guy, the guy who was playing with, um, uh, uh, who, who was with, uh, 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 John Fogarty. Oh, the, yeah. There's two guys from John Fogarty. I remember that, yeah. The, the young kid. Yes. He plays guitar for John Fogarty. That's so cool. Yeah. I remember so it's like, um, so, you know, guys like that get good gigs. Yeah. Problem is, uh, you don't never know when a band's going to break up. You never know when you get fired. And you don't know what they're going to be like. Like, I love Chris Jericho. Mm -hmm. We're friends. We make good albums together. We fight like we should. Um, you know, over things that are important, yeah. like creative things. Like he doesn't want to give room, I don't want to give room, and somewhere in between we respectfully find those areas. It's a good- That's a good- It is. It is, it is unhealthy at times that brings great results. Mm -hmm. I love Frank. I love playing in a band with Frank. I love Billy Gray. I, I like, I'm so lucky to be in a band with guys that I really love, you know, like, and y'all get along, you know. We that's do. Key, right? We have fun. Like before we go on stage, we bring out the freaking, you know, little U <laughs> Bluetooth speaker and listen to, you know, music, and we hang out and talk. Mm -hmm. Like we're literally friends. It is like going to summer camp with your best friends. Being on tour with Fozzie is a great thing. Doing shows with Robbie J is a great thing, and, and the idea of going and playing with somebody else who, who knows? I mean, they could be, you know. I mean. It, it, you get to the point where um, uh, the, 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 the carrot is just that, it's a carrot. They're trying to entice you to do something, that, uh, to take you away from something that you're happy with or at a place you are. And then you have to reassess why am I, why am I in the place I am? And do you take the risk on the carrot you know, for that? And I, I'm honestly, I'm not tempted by other women on the road. I'm not tempted by other bands. I've had lots of big offers from big bands. I mean, I had one offer from the biggest band on the planet. Like, like literally the biggest band on the you planet. Can you say it or you can't say it? I can't say it, yeah, oh. just because it would be inappropriate. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, and the money was crazy. Like, yeah, you know, five figures a week. Wow. Yeah, and I, like, but you just never know when it's gonna end. Mm -hmm. Like, and then what happens if it ends? Or what happens if they don't like me and they kick me out? Or what happens if I can't stand it and I gotta, I gotta leave? Yeah. You know, then my band's like, well, dude, you, you freaking bailed on us. We got somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I, found, I have found that if, if you find a place that you're happy with, nothing's perfect. There's no such thing, whether it's in a, in a romantic relationship or in a band or a job, there's no such thing as perfect. What there is is finding uh, that uh, life is never gonna be what you want it, but you're gonna have to work hard to just make the best out of, uh, of, of imperfect situations. And Fozzie's not perfect, but if you go talk to the guys in any band, there's no such thing as perfect for them. But, but I love, again, um, you know, I, I think we, we were talking off air. I was in a band called Adrenaline Mob for a very short period of time. Uh, when they, they it was Mike Portnoy. Mm -hmm. um, th when they first started the band, they wanted to hire me to play rhythm guitar. I was so excited. I've never played for somebody else before uh, that I was going to quote unquote possibly join the band because Russell Allen, the singer, is the singer for Symphony X, who I literally have the biggest man crush on on the planet because I think he's one of the best singers on the planet. Mm -hmm. He sings for Trans-Siberian Orchestra. He's like possibly one of the best male vocalists in rock there is. And I was so excited about being in a band and playing shows with them was so amazing. Like 
Portnoy's vocabulary and the fire he injects into stuff. It was just oh, yeah. magic. The guitar player, Mike Orlando, his right hand looks like it's an illusion, like this, <laughs> like it's been sped up. Yeah. Like I, he, the physics of how his hand, the, the twitch on his speed, I've, I, I literally could sit right there and look at it and it didn't look real. Oh, really? Yeah, there was something, you know how some guys, you look at some guy run, it's like, I don't, it doesn't look natural, he's running too fast. <laughs> like, you know, like there's some people who just genetically, there's something about their body yeah. that allows them to do things that are unnatural. Yeah. And he was just the fastest guitar player I've ever seen. And, and Paul DeLeo was the bass player. Yes, um, oh yeah. And it was so much fun and it was like, Playing with in a band where everybody in the band is, of of of, of I was the best. It was God. It was like heaven every night going out. And yet, when I was off stage, it was like there was, I I didn't feel like we were in a band. There was no camaraderie. It was weird. Like everybody's angry. The guitar player and the singer getting in constant fights. It's like this is never gonna last. Like, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, you know, you ever been on a double date with someone and, you, and they, they start like arguing like before the appetizers are there. It's like, I don't know why they're not divorced already. You know what I mean? Like, you, does it take, you know, when you're 25, you don't have the vision. Yeah. Like, you don't, like, you just say, oh, well, couples fight. It's like, you know the difference between people who are a little disrespectful or whatever and, right. and people like, there's no way this is gonna work. <laughs> so I was like, I wrote Portnoy an email and I just said, listen, dude, I'm, I'm just gonna have to roll. He's like, why? Uh, and I was like, it's just, it's not gonna last. And then it's like, it, you know, and I need to focus on my band and you're, there's more and more touring. Um, Cause Mike basically, he had a, we had a meeting and, and Portnoy basically said, hey, we're gonna have to prioritize Adrenaline Mob. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I can't. Like you literally said this was a side project and you literally said you have a bunch of other bands. Mm -hmm. Um, it made me appreciate uh, that as amazing musically as it was to play with the top players in the world uh, at what they do, I missed my band. Mm -hmm. You know, I missed, because I'm, I, I actually play better with Frank than I play with Portnoy, because the way I play suits his style. Yeah. Our chemistry was so good. Like there were moments playing with Portnoy, I was like, I was unsure of my pocket, and I'm never unsure of my pocket. Like I'm, I'm a lot of, there's a lot of things that I have like strengths and weaknesses. My weaknesses aren't in playing in a, po in a pocket. I mean, that's my thing, is my groove. And there were moments where I was like, I don't know where I am with him, <laughs> because where he plays yeah. was not in the same place I play. And uh, so I thought that was, uh, it was a, a good, you know, I guess that's why they always say have a few sex partners before you get married. <laughs> like just to make sure that you, yeah. <laughs> you, got, you know what works for you and what doesn't or whatever. But it's the same in music. It's, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of chemistry that you have to figure out. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm just lucky. I'm real lucky that I, I get the opportunity to play with those guys. That's awesome. And then your last album, with, not your final last album, but the last time you did was Judas. Could be my last one. You never know. <laughs> Could be the word yeah, that. yeah. I mean, the band is not going to break up, but who knows? Yeah. <laughs> so this thing blew up <clears throat> with Judas and the amount of views. You know, Nathan Meyer filming it. How many million views do you have now? It's, it's like up to 20 now, right? Yeah. Something? Yeah. It's yeah. insane. Uh, I, I love it, though. It's the perfect storm of a great song and a great video and a great performance from Chris. Um, there is a lot of credit that I'm going to take on a lot of these records mm -hmm. because uh, I was the captain on almost all of these records. Like there, there was never one of these records that I wasn't there from the first moment that there was a drum machine or a programmed computer uh, drum, the first riff, the first melody, the first lyric, to I'm in New York getting it mastered. Like I, I'm there every step of the way. There's never a moment where I'm not in the studio and somebody else is. I'm every one of these records. This, this record, I cannot take credit for because it was much more of a collaborative re uh, album. Our producer, Johnny Andrews, was a massive part of this album. Uh, you know, on all these other records, there's a bunch of guys in the band who play roles, like just like you would if you were like I said, I always bring it back to sports, sports. franchises, you know, like everybody has a position to play. Right. Some, you know, have their hand on the ball a lot more than other people, but it doesn't minimize 
any other position because it, it, everyone has to play in position for it to work properly. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the record company approached me uh, and management and I, I, I you know, it was probably kind of now everybody, everything's group emails, you know, yeah. like, you know, like you get the group email. We were thinking, we were thinking, I don't know who we were, <laughs> but we were thinking about it maybe kind of cool to get an outside producer on this record. Uh, we had met Johnny because Johnny helped to co-write uh, Lights Go Out from Do You Want to Start a War? Oh, yeah. And he produced Chris's vocals on that song. So, and I know Johnny. Johnny and I used to work at Atlanta Discount Music together when we were teenagers. Like, so we knew each <laughs> other. So I was like, so they were like, what would you think about getting Johnny to produce the record? And they threw out two or three other names, big name producers. I was like, I won't do it with those guys. I'll do it with Johnny, because I know Johnny. Yeah. Uh, and I said, we had a good working relationship with him. He's so talented. What I think was the best asset and the most frustrating thing for me was uh, Fozzie has a process now. The process, um, just like if, again, sports franchise, NASCAR driver, whatever. Once you have a team and you go to the track every week and you know how things are gonna go, now you have a new team owner and he's like, we're gonna do things differently. Yeah. And it was like, it was very hard for me because I thought I knew what the best way was because we had a process, right? And my process is this is yeah. what we do and this is, how, this is how we make the records, how we write the songs and stuff. And he was like, well, he had a different idea about it and it was really, it was, God, man, it was, it was so hard. I was so, there was several times where I, I called Chris, I was like, I can't do this. It's like, I was, I literally was losing it. Yeah. Because, um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I wanna go off camera so you, I can just show you what it was like, but, so there were times where the producer would be sitting at the console, Johnny, and I'd sit on the couch behind him, six to eight feet behind him with a guitar in my hand and we wouldn't talk for two hours. <laughs> it's like, I think I'm losing my mind. The way I write is I come up with, with uh, I'll program some drums, something I really dig, or I'll come up with a riff and then I'll program some drums to that riff and then I'll play for three hours and I'll record a million different ideas. So I'll have like a basic idea and then I refine it and it leads me down this path. Oh, wait, ooh, ooh, okay, try this. Okay, do it again, da, da, da. And I, I literally will have 30 or 40 different ideas all over the same kind of thing, but it may mean that I change the original idea because it keeps morphing yeah. and evolving. Right, snowballing. Yes, I'm just like, and I'm following the breadcrumbs. Like the song is like, yes, and I love this process. With Johnny, it's a lot of time where we're thinking. <laughs> it's like, okay, so we're like, I, I don't, should I say something? I don't, I don't want to interrupt him. If he's in the middle of a thought, I don't want to mess this up. Don't make eye contact. So don't, yeah, so I just spent a lot of time looking at my phone. You know, like, I'm just like, I'm spending a shit ton of time on Twitter, like just looking at you know, what other people are doing because I'm not doing anything. And it was really weird, but Johnny was, he's an artist. I'm not an artist. I'm a rock guitar player. I like to make music and there are times like my solo record where I'm lucky where I trip and stumble and fall on some art because I really feel passionate about something and sometimes my rock guitar player chops cross over into something that's cool that I, I have something special to say but Johnny, every word matters. Mm -hmm. And he's a real lyricist guy where to me lyrics are always, I don't care about the lyrics unless the riff and the melody is great. If the riff and the melody are great, then, then my next thing is to work on lyrics. Johnny's about the lyric first, because the lyric has to connect. So with people, we have to, there's no more Dungeons and Dragons lyrics, never gonna happen on my watch. No more spiders in my mouth, no more bad tattoos. So you're saying like every little word, every little. Every word. Yes. Yeah. We labored over it. Wow. We just, yeah, and it was a lot of time just sitting there and taking notes and I'd be like, on my phone, like writing lyrics. And I was like, <clears throat> what, what about this? Hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll be quiet. So like, like, and I, our first day of writing, I came in with three song ideas that I thought were badass. Mm -hmm. And like, okay, first day of writing for the new record is like, I've made 18 records. Yeah, 
I got to, you know, like I, I start going, you know, I'm going through my, my, my confidence building <laughs> stuff where you start to like, oh, I don't want to be insecure on this thing. I want to be prepared <laughs> and remember who you are. <laughs> right. Okay. So I go and I play him these three songs and Johnny's listening. Okay. Um, why don't we just try something new? I was like, oh my God. Like, like it was, it was crazy. Like it, it so we I laugh about now, but then was it really frustrating? Like this is a bad idea kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. And he's a keyboard player. Oh wow. Yeah. So like, yeah. And his favorite bands are Depeche Mode. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I was losing my mind. I was like, I literally was telling the text messages. He doesn't even like our band. Like, like I was going, this is, Oh, you, you guys should have filmed this like some kind of monster. It we, been like no, because it had been it would have shown me in a terrible light. <laughs> yeah, if you ever get a chance to talk to Jericho about it, he will tell you I almost lost it because I I started second guessing myself. Like everything I was writing, like I started thinking. You know, you ever seen those video interviews of Ric Flair where there was a period of his life where he got super, like he, he was second guessing everything he was doing right. because the bosses were telling him, you know what you should do, man? You should cut your hair and put an earring in. Like they're telling, <laughs> it's like, I'm the nature boy. Like, you know, like, like, and so I was thinking, I'm a Duke of Metal, man. I know how to play riffs. Like I, you know, like I made, like I started, and it started messing with me so much that I didn't want to go back. I didn't want to go back over to the place. I'm getting a, there's a, there's a midget over here, <laughs> little person, sorry, he loves Rick Claire. So, so, uh, so long story short was, when the record was done, it was literally like having the strangest out of body experience of all time and it led to one of the best records I've ever made. And because Johnny is a real chef. Would you work with him again? Absolutely, love him, I'm, I'm going to. And we're going to do the next record with him. Uh, He's awesome. a genius. Yeah. Because all the writing and the production on this record is one of the best things I've ever done. It was one of the albums that I had the least primary. Um, it was much more collaborative is what I should say mm -hmm. than I'm used to. I'm used to being the head chef and having a bunch of guys that are working with me. Yeah. I wasn't the head chef on this. <laughs> and it was hard. It was hard to take a, a role into a, a thing where a producer who isn't in the band. Yeah. But when it was all said and done, I, I, and I got to sit back and listen to it. I was like, oh my God, he's a genius. All of these, and listen, I played my parts that I wanted to play. It wasn't like he was telling me, no, don't do that. Play this. It wasn't, there was none of that. It wasn't, no, Chris, you can't sing that. It was none of that. It was that he was a great coach. He was, he was trimming fat, saying, let's try this. Let's keep working. It was never your idea sucks. It wasn't like he was being a dick about it. He was just kindly saying, I think we can do better. It's like a boot camp. Right? Yes, I think we can do better. It was the, it was the, it was the, the, uh, the most sensitive boot camp ever. <laughs> <laughs> Always sweating was for me from just stress. Hey, well, I think we've got a, a, a gift for you since you've been, uh, since you're doing the show. My uh, model here, I said last time, Nathan. Oh, Nathan is a handsome man, is. which by the way, we're doing a new Fozzie video with the, the great Nathan Mowry soon. Yeah, we call him the Fozzie guy. So. Yes! Here you go, man. Oh my God. Oh, oh, he, oh God, <laughs> thank you so much. No problem, man. Oh. Thank you for being on the show. No, dude, this is amazing. Uh, okay, so when this we do- This is where you start crying, so we gotta keep that. <laughs> I, I will tell you this, if you, I have my entire hallway or frame photographs and albums, this means a lot to you. Awesome. I mean, really, like, That's this great. is amazing. It's beautiful. You wanna do the second one? We got two of them. What? Listen, I don't even deserve the first one. <laughs> oh my God, this is amazing. Put them all under the, the table there. And from... Oh man, <laughs> I have only one copy of this. Where did you awesome. find this? eBay, a long time ago. So, Do you have another copy for no, you? No, this is yours, man. This is yours. Okay, guess what? What's that? I'm gonna trade the one copy that I have at home and give tape it to trader. you. Yes, tape trading, <laughs> it's it. I got an old ECW cassette too. <laughs> nice, uh, nice. Man, that is amazing. This is the first thing we ever, this is the three song demo that got us our record deal. That's awesome. Yeah, Scott Burns in Tampa, Florida. This got down to him. I think he saw us at a show because we used to go down to Clearwater, Florida and Tampa all the time. 
And uh, he got this cassette at the show. And then this was the beginning of my, if it wasn't for this cassette, um, I would have no career. Or if I did, it would probably be playing Bananarama covers at the <laughs> Wild Wing Cafe. And if it wasn't for this record uh, right here, I'd be mowing grass right now this summer like literally the bookends of my life. The, the, the first thing that started my career and the biggest, one of the biggest albums of my career, which I'm most proud of. And uh, so that's really nice of you. Thank no you. Problem, man. Thank you for being on the show, bro. So appreciate we it. Ha we have to do this more often. Yeah, man. That's, that's amazing. I'm about to make another record though. Yeah. <laughs>